Hi everyone. Hello. Welcome to another MSI Insider live stream. Um, we're sorry, we're a little bit late. We had some de technical difficulties that unfortunately couldn't be solved right away. So unfortunately, we don't have Intel today. So we plan to have a talk with Alex from Intel, um, but we'll try to postpone this. In a couple of weeks, we'll have another uh, live stream um, related to um, 12th gen Intel Elder Lake. Um, so we'll try to, um, to get Alex in again and hopefully then it works properly. Uh, we had some connection issues, so we couldn't get a stable connection with him, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we'll try to tell you as much about the new uh, Elder Lake processors as we know. Of course, we don't know as much as Alex, uh, but still we want to give you a little bit about uh, the basics of these CPUs, about the architecture, about the production process, about the platform. Um, two weeks ago, we also had a live stream about our um, Z690 motherboards where we unveiled our uh, full Z690 lineup. So if you're interested in um, the features of specific models and which models we have, definitely go and check that out. You can uh, find it on YouTube. Um, today, we're going to talk about performance. And not only going to talk about it, because as you can see, right next to me, the one and only, <laughs> <laughs> Ruth is here. Uh, we even put it in his name tag, the, um, because yeah, without Ruth, um, we wouldn't be able to give you as much information as we can today. Because Ruth, you did a lot of testing with Elder Lake, right? A lot of testing, yes. There was a lot of unknowns and yeah, uh, also a lot of stuff we, we're still figuring out. It's very new and uh, uh, all the issues are. And yes. very different as well from previous generations. Yeah, de definitely different, but uh, different good. I yeah, it's say. also yeah. a lot for us still to find out. Yeah. Um, but for our demonstrations today, we can already see two systems in front of us. Um, yeah. So we have one based on uh, DDR5 memory, one based on DDR4 memory. Um, both are running uh, Core i9-12900K CPU. Yeah. Uh, so that way, we're, we're, we will try to show you a little bit of comparison as well between those uh, two options. But before we go into everything, make sure to join our giveaway because we have a special prize today. Rich, you have it right next to you, don't you? Uh, I do, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I have a big box and it's a heavy one. It's a Z690 yes. Carbon Wi-Fi. Sorry, MPG Z690 Carbon Wi-Fi, definitely. Yeah. So if you want to win this motherboard, go to msi.com slash 2 slash insider or if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch, uh, our bot will put um, a link in the chat once every five minutes. That will direct you to our Gleam giveaway. Within Gleam, you can perform several actions. The more you perform, the bigger chance you'll have to win. And if you're a returning visitor, make sure also to claim your loyalty bonus to give you a slight edge in the giveaway. And um, if you visit more live streams, your loyalty bonus will be slightly higher. Can I lower it? Okay. Um. <laughs> That's the price. I need back to um, Okay, let's continue. Let's first talk a little bit about the, uh, the Elder Lake platform because this is where a lot of changes uh, happened compared to the previous generations. Basically, from I believe the sixth generation, um, that was Intel Skylake. Um, and basically, that basic architecture has been used all the way up to the 11th generation, which was Rocket Lake, so the previous generation Intel, 11th gen. Um, and even on the fifth generation, Intel was already on 40 nanometers. And with a lot of pluses, uh, it was, but the basics were still 40 nanometers for Rocket Lake, so 11 gen. This generation is a lot different. This is a completely new platform with a completely new architecture, also a completely new production process. Um, it's called the Intel 7 production process. Can be a little bit confusing. It's a 10 nanometer process. Uh, so it's not the 40 nanometer plus, 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 plus anymore. Um, so really new. Also in terms of course, a lot of changes. Um, and of course, the new uh, features that this platform offers, offers. And the two biggest ones are, of course, DDR5 memory, but also PCI Express Gen 5. Um, for the CPUs themselves, there are also very big changes. Um, as we mentioned, we have both DDR4 and DDR5 models for Elder Lake. Um, that also means that the memory controller has changed, but there are a couple of more changes. We'll talk more about that later. Um, there is also a new integrated GPU in this. The, the Z690 chipset has a lot of different functionality as well. Uh, if you want more details about that, definitely check out our live stream uh, from two weeks ago. Um, 
And then let's go a little bit deeper into the CPU details of uh, Elder Lake. So the big change when comparing, for example, 11th gen, but also when you compare this to, to the current generation AMD, um, for 11th gen and the current generation AMD, all cores in the CPU are basically equal. Of course, some can boost a little bit higher than others, but in the base, they're equal. With um, Intel Elder Lake, so 12th generation, Intel shifts away from those equal cores. And basically what they're introducing is, is kind of a big little architecture. Uh, we already know this from, uh, from mobile processors. So for example, ARM also um, is doing this for quite a while. Um, and in this new CPU, you have two types of cores. One are the P cores, the performance cores, and the other one are the E cores, and those are the efficient cores. Um, it depends per exact model how many P cores you get and how many E cores you get. Um, but basically what they do is if you need a lot of performance, um, you will mostly use your P cores. Um, those will give you very high single core performance, so also give you a lot of uh, good gaming performance. More about that later. Um, and the E cores, they're more efficient, but they in multi-threaded tests, they will also play along, so you also get more multi-threaded performance. And also if you don't need a lot of power from your uh, from your system, so for example, if you're browsing around on the internet, um, the power draw of your CPU will also go back quite a lot, uh, so the idle consumption will not be extremely high because of the more efficient cores. Um, and this is all smartly being managed um, in, uh, in the CPU itself, but also the new um, thread director that you have within uh, Microsoft Windows. So today we will be running uh, Microsoft Windows 11, but Rich, you've been testing with both Windows 10 and 11, right? Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, Can you see a lot of changes in between the operating systems? Uh, yeah, some programs don't run well on, uh, uh, on Alder Lake and Windows 10. So uh, also, obviously, uh, Intel is uh, everybody pushing to Windows 11 because of the, uh, the scheduling part is uh, integrated into Windows 11. So uh, yeah, nobody should be using Windows 10 with this platform. Yeah, so definitely, if you're going Elder Lake, go for Windows 11 yep, because it will yep. give you extra benefit, more than with previous yep. generation. And of course, that has to do uh, with a specific yep. architecture. Yeah, some programs don't respond well to Windows 10. Some are equally, uh, uh, the performance is equal, but uh, also gaming. Uh, I saw a lot of drop in Windows 10 on Alder Lake, which I didn't see uh, the same amount of drop in uh, in other platform like uh, 11 gen or AMD uh, 5000 series. So, I see a question in chat. Mr. Masterdog says, Mike, are you still happy with your 5600X in the light of the 12600? Well, my case is so small that I wouldn't be able to cool the 12600 properly, I think, to get the maximum performance out of this. Um, yeah, so later on we'll also show you a little bit more about the TDPs because there the story also changed a little bit. And later in the stream yeah. we will also have a live demonstration. Of, we don't have the i5 and i7 here today. We have no. two core i9 systems. But there you can see a bit like in which situation, what it will do to the power draw, um, both the package power, but we also have um, uh, a power meter that shows yeah. the total draw of the system. Uh, Oli O is asking, what socket is this? This is LGA 1700. So that's different from the previous generations. Yeah. So 10th and 11th gen were LGA 1200, and the 12th gen is LGA 1700. Um, first, let's take a little bit, uh, take a look a little bit at the uh, performance graphs from Intel. Um, so this is what Intel claims in terms of single-threaded performance. This is, for example, something that's very important in gaming performance, um, but also in different, in, in other single-threaded workloads. Um, you should see quite a big bump when comparing. Um, the 10th generation already yeah. towards the 11th generation, but now the 12th generation is an even bigger step, of course, because of the new architecture. And Intel claims that the P cores, or the performance cores of the 12th generation Intel, uh, perform approximately 28% better than the cores you will find in the 10th generation. So that's Comet Lake S. Um, but also the E cores in the 12th generation Intel core should perform about equal as the cores you will find in the 10th generation um, Intel core processors. So it's not that the efficient cores are really weak cores that always run in the background and are not performing very well. The e, the e cores are also very strong cores, and yeah. they also, especially in multi-threaded workloads, you will see a big, big difference if you, for example, disable the yeah. e cores um, and only run it on the p cores, or if you have everything enabled. So the 
it's not that the, the uh, E cores are V cores at all. No. Um, uh, let me see some more questions. Yeah, somebody is already saying that some games won't run on 12th gen Intel uh, due to some DRM stuff like the Novo. The Novo. Uh, we're going to show that as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit hit or miss, so I'm not sure if I can demo it properly, but. Uh, yeah, and this is also something that yeah. will. Because it's a completely new it. architecture yeah. and games are not yet always optimized for this. No. So I know that a lot of recent games are already, um, the developers are announcing patches uh, to solve those issues. Yeah. Um, and also from our side, we're also working on it to see if we can improve stuff to improve compatibility um, with older games as well. Um, because of course, people like to play new games, but sometimes you always li also like to play a bit older games and then you want them to work as well. Um, let's first take a, uh, a look at the different SKUs that Intel launched um, in their 12th generation Intel Core. Um, at the moment, there are six different SKUs. Well, basically, there are uh, three different SKUs, um, and all of them you can get with or without integrated graphics. So for the i5, you get the uh, 12600K, that's the model with integrated graphics. You have the 12600KF, and as usual, the F means that it doesn't have integrated graphics. Then for the i7, you have the 12700K with iGPU, 12700KF without, and the same for Core i9, 12900K and the 12900KF. Um, and a big difference here is, for example, in the uh, 11th generation, the number of cores between the Core i7 and the Core i9 was equal. Um, that's different in this generation. So both the Core i7 and the Core i9, they both have eight P cores, so the performance cores, but the Core i9 offers eight E cores next to it, uh, whereas the uh, Core i7 has four E cores. Um, so this is specifically something you will uh, see in very multi-threaded workloads, where you really need the extra performance of those those E cores. You will see you see quite a difference there. Um, and the Core i5 offers six P cores and four E cores. Then for the memory, as we mentioned. Uh, Elder Lake supports both DDR4 and DDR5. Uh, the officials officially supported speeds are DDR4 3200 and for DDR5 4800. That doesn't mean that that's the maximum. You can definitely go higher. I think the, the DDR5 kit we're using is 5200 megahertz by default, right? Yeah. But our uh, in-house overclocker by default, but it's uh, XMP. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the XMP. Yeah. Um, but our in-house overclocker already uh, achieved way higher clock speeds. We will show you later. Um, also DDR4, of course, you can also go beyond 3200 megahertz, um, but this is the officially supported speed by Intel. Um, then the, there is a bit of a change in the, in the TDP area. We now have two D TDP values. You have the, like the regular TDP value you know, from previous generations as well, and there is a separate one, which is max turbo TDP. And these are the official TDPs from Intel. That doesn't mean that if you put one of these CPUs on an MSI motherboard, that this will always be the maximum because some motherboards are powerful enough and the VRM is very powerful. Um, and if your cooling is strong enough as well, you can go beyond this to get even more performance. Um, but the difference is, uh, like all the, the standard TDP of all these CPUs is 125 watts. For the i5, you see that the max turbo uh, TDP is not much higher, it's 150 watts. For the i7, it's 190 watts. And for the i9, it's all the way up to 241 watts. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a difference there, um, but this is just the TDP set by Intel, and this will definitely, uh, this can definitely change based on your settings. Um, then I would like to show you a little bit of an overview um, where these CPUs stack in terms of performance, because two weeks ago uh, we only talked about our motherboards and we talked a bit about the new CPUs, but we couldn't talk about performance yet because of course the Intel NDA. Now we can show you everything. Um, and we can also demonstrate you everything. Uh, we did a lot of in-house testing already with a lot of different CPUs. Of course, this is not something we can show you in a live stream because this takes a lot of time to test all these CPUs and to get all these results. Um, but we qu quickly wanted to, to show you an overview. So you see um, the general performance in Cinebench, um, where they stack up in terms of single core performance and in terms of uh, multi-core performance. And as you can see, when we're looking at the 12600 KF, uh, and the, six, uh, the 12600K, in terms of single threaded performance, they are basically already faster than what we've seen in, in 
any CPU so far. Um, and a single threaded performance goes for, for all uh, Elder Lake processors. It's, it's quite a big step up from what we've seen so far. Um, and in a multi-threaded workload, you also see that the, the efficient cores, the E-cores, really help because um, even the 12600K has a higher multi-core score than, for example, um, the, the Comet Lake Core i9. So the, the 10900K and the, the 10850K, uh, both of those CPUs are 10 core CPUs. Um, so they've got 10 identical cores. And this one with the P and E cores combined, uh, the Core i5 also has 10 cores, um, six more powerful ones, four more efficient ones, and the multi-threaded performance of those i5 is even stronger than um, the multi-threaded performance of uh, very recent Core i9 processors still. So it's a, it's a big step up. And the single core performance is also something you will really see in the gaming performance of these CPUs. Um, when looking at the Core i7, you can see that both in the single threaded, uh, the single core and the multi-core performance, um, this CPU, for example, outperforms a Ryzen 9 5900X. Um, so also quite a, a lot of performance there you get out of your CPU. And the 12900K and KF, they also slightly outperform, um, for example, the 5950X uh, from AMD, which is a 16-core processor. So a lot of performance here, and Ruth also has um, yeah, some li live demonstration for you prepared. So let me yep. switch to Ruth's system. What do you want to see? I think uh, let's do a little bit of Cinebench, because the, the overview we just saw is Cinebench um, 23. That one takes quite long, so I believe you have Cinebench 20 also ready. Yeah, I can also do 23 uh, and do a single run, whatever yeah, you want. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, this is the 20. Uh, I'll just copy the link from the 23. Just creating the shortcut. Okay. I also want to see the power and the clocks probably, so I'm gonna run the HW info and then only the sensors. At the moment, I'm running with the XMP profile, so it's uh, running at 5200 uh, DDR5. Quickly grabbing a drink. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, yeah. So now it's only doing one run, and I will show you the powers and also the temperatures and stuff. So now it's boosting up to 4.9 on the P core. I only listed one P core and one E core, but then you can see what the default behavior is of this uh, CPU. Uh, so it's a 4.9 and 3.7 on the E core and it's drawing r roughly between 210 and 215 watts uh, of package power. Uh, it differs a little bit between the CPUs because I have another CPU here, and that shows in software that it's doing 240 watts. But if I measure it with uh, uh, the current clamp or with uh, the wall meter, um, yeah, it draws a little bit more power, but not that much pow more power than the software is reading. So I'm not sure uh, if the, the software is 100% accurate uh, on that uh, metric. Uh, the voltages and stuff are quite normal. Um, uh, and also the, the package power, no, it, it's, a, it's a rough guide for, for what you can expect. So if the CPU is doing like something like 20, 215 to 240 watts, you need a well, pretty good cooler. Uh, it's not that, uh, that you can uh, easily cool it with a simple air cooler. So. Uh, that's why everybody and most media is saying that they need at least uh, a 360 water cooling. Yeah, that's also what we're using right now. So yeah. As you can see, both these systems run our yeah. new Core Liquid uh, S360 liquid cooler. So yeah. that's a really high-end, really powerful all-in-one liquid cooler. Of course, it depends a little bit on the type of CPU you're going to get. Like, yeah. this is the Core i9, the top model in the Outer Lake series. Then, yeah, I, I would definitely suggest go for a 360 millimeter all-in-one cooler. Of course, if you're going with an i5, you will be fine, for example, with a 240 uh, millimeter cooler. So it really depends on which uh, exact setup you have. Also depends, of course, on the airflow you have in your case, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, definitely you get a lot more performance out of these CPUs if you have proper cooling. Yeah, the, the 241 max turbo is not reached by this CPU, at least not uh, according to the software readings. And uh, that also means that you're basically 
unlocked on most mother, at least on the Z690 motherboards from MSI, you're totally unlocked. Uh, so the power is not limited at all. Um, you, you can still tweak the power limit. So if, if you have a smaller cooler, like a 240 or something, uh, and the 200 uh, plus watts is, is, is too much for your case and your airflow, uh, you can still tune the power limit. So use that power limit to, to have like the, the best possible um, uh, thermals in your case and still have the maximum performance. So that depends on, on the situation of your uh, system. I see a question in the chat, what about the i7-12700K? Later on I have an overview um, where you see a bit of the, um, how it translates to the temperatures if you're on yeah. the same cooling setup with an i9, with an i7 or with an i5. Um, but yeah, you definitely will see a difference there uh, in terms of power consumption. Of course, it depends a little bit on the workload. Uh, yeah. In certain workloads, you can also get the uh, i9 to be very efficient. Um, but in other workloads, when you really want to get that maximum performance out yeah. of the CPU, uh, you can definitely see uh, quite high power consumption, especially for the higher-end parts. Yeah, Cinebench loads all the cores. The P's and the E's are fully loaded, so that, that's a very extreme uh, uh, use case. So uh, in gaming, uh, it, it draws around, I would say, about 80 to 90 watts. So that's a lot different than the two, uh, 220 we see, we're seeing in this, uh, this kind of program. Yeah, also that's also a, a very important point that it doesn't, because I saw some people were a little bit confused about how it works with the P and the E cores. It's not that it switches back and forth. It's not that now it runs on the P cores and now I'm going back to my desktop and it switches to the E cores. No, if you're going to do, for example, if you fully want to utilize the power of your CPU, like we're currently doing in Cinebench, it will not switch to the P cores. No, it will enable everything. So we'll, you're using both your P cores and your E cores. And that's also why you see the very yeah, good multi-threaded performance. Because in this situation, can, yeah. it's it's 16 cores. It's yeah. eight of the P cores and eight of the E cores. Yeah, you you can remember the the number. It's uh, about uh, 27,500. Uh, uh, and later on, we can disable the E cores and see what we were left with. So we can also do that. Also, if you're um, running an older installation and you're upgrading, make sure to update all your software, because a lot of software is also, if you're using an old version, it's not yet optimized for this architecture. So here you can also see that it can, uh, for example, split the P cores and the E cores. Make sure to use the latest software, but I would definitely suggest if you're going for a new Alder Lake build, do a fresh installation and also directly go for Windows 11, really to get the maximum out of your yeah, Alder yeah. Lake CPU. Definitely, yeah. You want to go back to the slides or you want to demo something else? Um, yeah, maybe we can because I think you just did the multi-core. Maybe we can do a quick single-core run. Uh, yeah, that's not quick. So Probably R20 maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the single core is quite long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can, we can run it in the background CPU. and we yeah. will continue in the meanwhile. Yeah. So if you're getting a, a non-F model, so the, the, the regular K models, they also come with integrated graphics, and that's also been upgraded compared to uh, the Rocket Lake generation. So these CPUs come with um, the Intel um, UHD 770i GPU. So in the previous generation, that was the uh, 750. Um, and you can see a bit of a bump up in performance, but it's definitely not that these iGPUs are perfect for gaming. So if you want to game on them, definitely go for a discrete graphics card. Um, also, if you compare them, for example, to AMD's APUs, so the 5000 um, series with the G on the end, so 5600G, 5700G, uh, with the Vega graphics, you can see that those are still significantly faster um, in terms of gaming performance. So you see a couple of, of examples. You also see 3D Mark. Um, and yeah, it is, it is a little bit of a bump up compared to uh, the 750, but the 770 is definitely not... Um, a gaming iGPU, I would say. Then to come back to um, one of those questions, um, what the values are like for the i7, but also the i5. Um, here you see a temperature overview uh, when running AVX workloads and when running non-AVX workloads. Uh, here you can see the CPU temp, the MOS temp, uh, and the total package power. So as you can see, um, the temperatures 
uh, if you're using the same cooling solution, the temperatures between the i5, the i7 and the i9, they differ quite a lot. Um, so really make sure to adjust the, the, the cooling solution that you're going for based on the CPU you're getting. So if you're going with the i9, don't go for uh, a limited cooling solution. Don't go, for example, for a 120 millimeter radiator because they're not powerful enough to get the maximum performance out of these CPUs. Um, so like in general, I would recommend for an i5, go for 240 millimeter at least. If you're going for the i7, try to go 280 if possible. And for the i9, even go 360 millimeter radiator. And all-in-one liquid coolers are definitely the way to go for Elder Lake, I think. You can do, if you have like a really big tower cooler, um, they can still perform quite well and they can get, uh, I would say for an i5, definitely doable. But yeah, if you really want to get maximum performance out of an i7 or even an i9, then that it will get tricky with an with, um, air cooler, even with the bigger ones. Yeah. Th these kind of uh, programs are basically also kind of a power wire. So uh, that was also the, the case for the 11th and the 10th gen CPU. So uh, it wasn't very weird to see 300 watts package power on a 10900K. So. Uh, and even on the 11900 k as well, uh, because they had the ABT and stuff, it would go over the 320, I believe. So, uh, but uh, if you don't limit those kind of powers, then it's it's you know, almost impossible to cool in such a small uh, surface area. So, uh, yeah, then even 360 won't be enough. And I see a question in chat. Um, Joram Lim is asking, uh, sorry, may I know what the MOS temp is actually? Uh, the MOS temp is basically the temperature of the power delivery circuit on the motherboard. Um, so the green bars you see here is, is not a temperature in the CPU, it's a temperature of the power delivery on the motherboard. So the power stages in this yeah. situation. Um, it depends very much on which motherboard you're using. Um, how high that, that temperature will be because they have different power delivery components like the top-end models, for example. Uh, the system root has in front of him right now is based on the MEG Z690 Unify. That's one of our top-end models and it has yeah. 19 105 amp smart power stages only to power the CPU. So that's an extremely strong VRM design. Um, and even if you put an i9 at it at full load, it will still have very acceptable temperatures. Um, maybe if we go to back to our system, here you can also see the MOS temperature. Yep. Right now, of course, we're running a, a single-threaded test, so now it's really low. Yeah, it's only doing like 35 watts. Yeah, the package so power yeah. is really low. Um, but even in the multi-threaded uh, workload, with this motherboard, it won't be an issue at all. Um, yeah. Of course, if you're going for the most affordable motherboard and you're getting the most uh, powerful CPU, the i9, then you will see um, uh, higher temperatures here, uh, but still if your airflow in your case also a very important factor here So if you have good airflow in your case um, then sometimes um, a lower-end motherboard is perfectly fine uh, Even with a higher-end CPU if your airflow is very limited um, Then of course you will probably need uh, a higher-end motherboard in order to get uh, good VRM temperatures um, but yeah, these, the, the VRMs on our Z690 motherboards, later on we'll go into more detail, but they got a huge upgrade uh, again compared to the previous generation. So that's the MOS temperature. And the blue line you see here is the package power. So that's the basically the power draw of just the CPU. Now it's hard to read for me, but uh, the, the Prime 95, that's the AVX one, uh, but the AIDA uh, FPU test is also an AVX one, but uh, not as intense on, uh, on the AVX part as the Prime 95. Yeah, and that's why you see the yeah. big difference in power draw. So yeah. for example, the, the 12900K um, that we're currently also using, that one has a, a package power of almost 275 watts in this uh, example with the Prime 95 AVX. Yeah. AVX. And in AIDA, you can see it's a, it's a bit lower. Um, it's still quite a big power draw. It's still uh, yeah. Yeah, around 230, 240 watts. Um, so yeah. Um, then the Naxelo is asking, what is VRM? Can someone tell me? The VRM is the power delivery circuit on the motherboard that powers the CPU. Um, so it stands for a uh, voltage regulator module. Uh, so basically what, yeah, what it does is you get the power from your power supply into the motherboard and the motherboard makes basically a usable voltage and usable power for your CPU. Um, and the components that do that, so you have the, the PWM controller, 
you have the, the power stages, you have the chokes, you have the capacitors, and the whole solution is called the VRM. And the VRM, of course, differs per motherboard. So a higher-end motherboard will have a stronger VRM, so we'll be able to power a higher-end CPU at lower VRM temperatures. The, the Cinebench the single thread is finished. Um, as you can see on the right, um, here's the CPU usage part. I resetted it while it was running. So you can see that the e-cores were hardly used. Uh, so um, only maybe a, a peak for maybe background tasks, but not for the Cinebench run. Uh, most of the cores, or uh, the core that was used the most is the uh, P-Core 2 thread 0. So that's a 58 average, uh, meaning that was doing the bulk of the um, Cinebench load. And we got uh, 2016 points, uh, 2016 points on the single thread uh, uh, part. Uh, if I would disable the E course, I can do the single uh, thread run again, but it won't affect anything because they, they will only be run at the P course. Uh, I can disable it and then come back and, and uh, uh, do the multi-core test again. And then you can continue with the slides. Yeah, so if you if we look at the score here, you see a little bit over 2,000. That's even slightly higher than what we have in our overview here. Uh, so 27,500 is also what you got approximately in the, in yeah. the multi-core one. Yeah, if you close the HW Info sensor page, then probably a few points higher, but yeah. not that much. Of course, the more you have running in the background, the lower your score score will be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really, and also there's some variation between two runs. You know, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it, it, also the points are very high. So, the, the slide yeah, so it's the, also the, yeah. the difference you see between the scores and the graph and the it's getting now. Yeah. It's all within margin of error, so it's all really close. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really powerful CPU, um, especially in the single threaded workloads. Of course, you can get even more multi-core performance if you get those high-end desktop platform processors. They can, for example, go all the way up to. Uh, to 64 cores, um, and then yeah, they, they will be even more powerful in multi-threaded workloads. Um, but in terms of single-threaded, this is basically the fastest uh, you can get at the moment. Um, and that's, for example, for gaming, but also other single-threaded workloads. That's where Elder Lake will benefit a lot. So yeah, we talked about the iGPU. We talked about the, um, the temperatures. And now also, let's take a look at the uh, temperatures in between the P cores and the E cores, because the power draw of a P core, is a performance core, is higher than of the E core, the efficient core. So also when you're measuring them against each other, you see that the, the P cores, they will get uh, a little bit harder than the E cores when running them on a full load. So in this specific example, you see Prime 95 AVX. So that's a really, really, really high workload. Um, so you're really stressing uh, your full CPU here, so both the P cores and the E cores are under full load in this situation. Um, but yeah, you see that the, the P cores definitely they do get a bit harder than the E cores. Um, and you also see the difference again between the i9, the i7 and the i5. Chip tuning 666 is asking, when will MSI introduce a Z690M uh, micro ATX motherboard. Maybe we're working on one. Cannot go into too much details, but maybe. Then let's continue a bit on cooling, because as you can see, these kind of power draws, they do need a lot of cooling. And we know that there's some um, uh, motherboards in the market currently that, for example, offer uh, LGA 1200 um, cooling support on Elder Lake. Uh, so on a, a Z690 motherboard. Um, but it's something important to keep in mind is that um, it's not just the mounting holes that changed. Also the, the CPU um, and mostly the height of the CPU is different when you're comparing um, Rocket Lake and Comet Lake, so the, the LGA1200 CPUs, to Elder Lake, the LGA1700 CPUs. So we definitely recommend if you're going for an Elder Lake uh, CPU, make sure that you really have a dedicated LGA 1700 bracket because this will um, differ in the mounting pressure that you're able to get on your CPU. And if your mounting pressure is not, not enough, then it will also hurt your cooling a lot. Um, so definitely make sure to get the right bracket um, 
So an LGA 1700 bracket for an LGA 1700 CPU. Even if in some situations you can use it, for example, with uh, the LGA 1200 bracket, which is the same bracket as you have for the uh, 11.5 series, so 1150, 1151, uh, etc. Um, but yeah, definitely it is important that you get the right bracket. Even if you have the mounting holes, it may still hurt your cooling performance. Talking about those um, uh, LGA 1700 brackets on our core liquid liquid coolers, um, on our MEG Core Liquid S series, so those are the models we're using today, they already come with the LGA 1700 bracket out of the box. Um, the same goes for our new C and P series models. All of them already come with the LGA 1700 bracket. Um, for the models that we already had in our assortment before, so the MPG Core Liquid K series and the MPG Core Liquid R series, um, the new V2 versions, they also come with an LGA 1700 uh, 100 bracket included in the box but if you happen to have uh, an earlier version so if you already own one and which didn't come with the LGA 1700 bracket we also have uh, a free upgrade kit um, you can check our website for more information on how to obtain one um, but yeah you can get one uh, if you apply between uh, September 27th so you can already do this um, until the 30th of April 2022 um, you do need your serial number and proof of purchase and then you can get one free of charge. So this goes for the MAG Core Liquid R models, so the 240R, 280R, 360R, but also the Core Liquid K240 and K360. So this is for the first versions of these coolers, um, because right now there is also a V2 version and those already come with the LGA 1700 bracket. Okay, so the Cinebench run is finished without the e-cores this time. Uh, there's a little strange behavior going on um, because now looking at the package power, it's even higher than with the e-cores. So uh, what I've noticed is that the, 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 the v-core uh, voltage is set way higher when the e-cores are not there. Um, not sure why that is, but uh, this behavior seems to be also in our, on our competitor boards. Uh, but losing the, the e-cores uh, also loses about 7,000 points on the, um, the multi-core test. So that we had 27,500, something like that? Yeah. So yeah, about uh, 7,400 points were lost. Uh, so that I'm so there you sure. see the importance yeah. of the e-cores in the multi-threaded workloads. So uh, I don't know exactly percentage-wise, but it's roughly around 30% was uh, done by the e-cores in this test so uh, that's a nice bonus uh, performance i see a lot of people in the chat asking when will msi release a z690 godlike will we at all <laughs> maybe we will maybe we won't time will tell uh, steve p is asking when will the z690i unify itx board be available um, that one should be i believe in the coming weeks it depends a bit per region um, but that one should arrive relatively soon. It will be a bit like you can already find the first models right now in the stores, C690 models. The ITX model is a little bit later um, than the first ATX models, uh, but it shouldn't take too long before you will be able to buy uh, the C690i Unify uh, in the store as well. It's best to check with your local retailer because it, it can differ a little bit per region uh, when stock arrives in the store. Um, so your local retailer should be able to provide you with a little bit more information about when they expect uh, to get the mini IT export. Uh, Sir Skilligan is asking, would you recommend a 360 millimeter all-in-one over a 280 millimeter all-in-one? First, it really depends per model. Um, if you're comparing like the same liquid coolers, the 280 and the 360, then the 360 should cool a little bit better than the 280. Uh, but 280 in terms of surface also quite quite a step up compared to the 240 millimeter bottle um, and it also depends on the space that you have in your case of course if you uh, don't have the space for a 360 then a 280 can definitely be uh, a really good alternative and it still can offer a lot of cooling performance um, also if you're for example going for an i5 um, or maybe even an i7 a 280 millimeter model will, will be perfectly fine in most situations already um, Volvo240 is asking, will you guys have Z690 with both DDR4 and DDR5? 
Um, we have separate models, some support DDR4, DDR5, but we don't have any plans to have like any Frankenstein boards that can support both DDR4 <laughs> and DDR5. Like I think you mean that, that have both slots available. We're not planning on those at the moment. Um, hi, where is the winner's list from the past October 31st? I don't know exactly what you're talking about, so maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, but when talking about winners, we have a giveaway today. So if you haven't participated yet, go to msi.com slash two slash insider uh, or follow the Gleam link um, on YouTube or Twitch that will be posted by our bot once every five minutes. And you have the chance to win. Ruud, can you show it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <coughs> the MPG is Z690 carbon Wi-Fi motherboard. So if you want to ch have a chance to win this one, two weeks ago we already gave one of these away. Um, today we will have another winner, a brand new Z690 motherboard. So make sure to participate if you haven't done so yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then let's take a look at uh, some new BIOS features as well that we have with these uh, new CPUs because you can, of course, fully control um, the, the cores on these CPUs as well. I say fully, that's not entirely true because you can um, disable E cores, for example, but you cannot disable all P cores. No. So I, I believe you can um, disable all of them apart from at least one, right? Yeah, yeah. you need at least one P core. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe you can go into the BIOS and show a little bit of how yeah. people can it's do it. It's a bit this. tricky because uh, we have a display port connected to the monitor I'm looking at and we have the HDMI uh, to the capture card, so I'm, I'm going to make your screen a little bit bigger, so you should be able to see it there up front. Uh, if I uh, restart and unplug my monitor, I, we should be seeing it on the capture, right? Yeah, <laughs> let's that's what I hope. Oh, let, let's try <laughs> that, okay? <laughs> yeah, let's Kay. try that. Yeah, the restarting, disconnecting the display port. So let's do the capture and see if we get to the bias ah looks it looks good if both are connected then it only shows up on the monitor so the display port is the uh, the first output it will take so if i leave it connected uh, we're not going to show you uh, on the stream uh, anything so for the yeah the bias is uh, yeah very uh, relatively Similar to the one, so uh, yeah, so still click BIOS 5, so it should look familiar for people yeah. who already had previous MSI board. Yeah, so basically, what you're going to need is uh, go to the uh, advanced mode. So we have a uh, easy mode and an advanced mode. You can switch with the F7 uh, key, uh, and then you can go to the OC menu. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, you can also do uh, overclocking, we will show you later. Uh, but the advanced CPU configuration, that's where you can enable and disable uh, the e cores, for example. That's what I did uh, in the previous run. Uh, but you can also say I want to have them enabled. Uh, and then you can just select them, select the ones you want to enable or enable them all. Or uh, if you uh, do e core control disabled, then they're enabled. That, that's a bit tricky, but yeah, the P core part, uh, you can also, uh, the control you can enable, and then you can disable a few P cores and then only run the E core, uh, one P core and all the E cores, for example. I haven't tried that one yet, so maybe that's interesting or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, let's uh, keep P core zero and then disable the other ones. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, then one is also grayed out, so you cannot disable that one as well. So now we should have one P core and uh, eight E cores, right? Yeah. Yep. See what happens. See, so gamer the forty is still spamming about the contest. Which context are you talking about? And just spamming the same sentence won't help anyone. So the the eight P cores did about twenty thousand points, right? So it should do like 
like 1200 points per core so that one is doing 1200 plus seven so guessing that it's doing probably what should it do something like 85 8500 something like that I'm waiting to, uh, uh, no. for the monitor to come back. <laughs> now we're only seeing it on stream, but I'm not seeing it here. No signal. Did I connect it properly? Or do I need to set it up? It's kind of small. Is this duplicate? Yes, that's duplicate. It's different sizes, right? Should become equal. You can try Windows key P. That should also hover you through. Then it's doing here something. I cannot read it. <laughs> can you read it? Desk PC screen only. Press it another time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the I thing know. I'm seeing my. I'm seeing uh, the image on the screen. Yeah. yeah it's ah, doing nice. Okay. 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 Uh, it took a while. Okay. Anyways. Uh, yeah. Let's see what's uh, what's in HW info. So the the, the P core zero is still there. Uh, so with two threads, and then the rest is just E core. So eight of them. Okay, let's uh, do the Cinebench twenty three and see what happens. See what score we get, or what power we have. That's also interesting. So the E cores plus one P core does about 70 watts, roughly. So that's 70 of the 215. Yeah, OK. It's not too bad. So these should be like. Uh, an 8 core 10 gen? No, uh, not really, right? The clocks are different. Are uh, still 3.7. So. so, yeah, now you can also see that the package power is relatively low, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Benchmark is, is uh, taking a little bit longer, of course. Still not as slow as I expected. No, no, it's actually quite good. Oh, it's even higher than I thought. Yeah, my yeah, predictions were the wrong. Nine cores. So now you have, and this is quite an interesting one. One because the E cores, they are eight cores. And they don't have hyper threading, so eight cores, eight threads. Then you have the P core. There is one enabled right now, so that's nine cores. But the P core also has hyper threading. It's also yeah. one of the differences between the E and the P cores. So that's why you now in Cinebench, for example, see nine cores, ten threads. So that's eight threads from the eight E cores and two threads from the one P core with hyper threading. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> I so still, even with mostly E cores, it's still pretty fast CPU. Yeah. I didn't expect this. Yeah, this high number. Yeah. Actually, well, yeah, I was my calculation were wrong. Yeah. And okay. now the CPU package power is really, really low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, the efficiency on this one is pretty good if you compare Cinebench scores per watt. Yeah. 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 And then we have another cool feature in our BIOS, which is CPU Force 2. And basically what CPU Force 2 does, it, it measures basically the quality of your CPU. So even if you have the same CPU, so 12900K, you can have two different samples, there will always be a slight variation in the quality of a CPU. Not every CPU is 100% identical. Um, so one will overclock a little bit better, one can run in certain settings with a little bit lower voltage than the other. 
Um, so in our MEG motherboards, we have our CPU Force 2 feature, and in that one, basically what the motherboard does it, is it measures the quality of the CPU. Um, so by using this, it will, um, it will give you a number, and the lower number, the higher the quality of the CPU is. And um, every time you boot, the, the system will measure this. So also, there's always a, a little bit of a margin here, so you, you will not see an identical number uh, if you reboot your system. Um, so you can see a slight variation there uh, because it's a different measurement and you always have a margin of error. Um, and this comparison feature is um, you can only compare the same CPU. So you can, for example, compare uh, the i5 12600K with another 12600K. You can compare 12900K with the 12900K, but you cannot compare, for example, the i5 12600K to an i9 12900K. So this is really, for example, if you want to do a little bit of basic binning of your CPUs. Um, so for example, if you want to go uh, overclocking, you have several CPUs available uh, to give you an indication of, of the, which one should be the best quality, um, you can use CPU Force 2. So maybe we can also show this in the BIOS. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <You're> fast. <laughs> yeah, I was just yeah unplugging it and just pressing delete and see if it, <laughs> it would work. Uh, uh, also, somebody's asking: uh, uh, Is this feature uh, MSI unique feature? Um, I believe there are similar kind of features with a different name. I'm not sure if they work in an identical way. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. I only know the the CPU Force Two we have. Yeah, I don't know exactly how how competitor features work. Yeah, basically this CPU reads 2100, and that's also the score I had previously. So it seems to fluctuate from boot to, to boot, but yeah, yeah, this is the number I saw the most. Uh, I forgot to do the, the other one, so maybe. Yeah, and the other know. one is the DDR4 system we're using, and that one yeah. is an MAG model. This feature is only available yeah. on MEG models. I see that's also a question in chat. MC is asking, is this just on MEG model boards? Yes, yeah. this is specifically a feature that yeah. you'll find on MEG models. Yeah, unfortunately I didn't do it on the other CPU, so then, then we had like two yeah. CPUs to compare and also see the numbers, uh, uh, which one should be the better overclocker. Uh, I, MC I is asking, is it MPG yeah. also? No, only MEG models. Okay. You want to see uh, some other stuff oh. in the bias? Yeah, or? let me get back to yes. Uh, because we have something similar for the memory as well. Uh, th that's probably a, a later topic, but that's <laughs> actually a very good bridge because the memory is our next topic. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good, good. <laughs> it looks like it's rehearsed, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have a memory force, and here you see the bars. So basically, uh, it can help you identify which slot and which uh, uh, DIMM module, so the ones you have inserted, are the better ones. And you can also uh, retest them and, and swap them from slot to slot and see uh, what would give you the best chance of overclocking your memory. Uh, of course, you still want to have like two, two DIMMs inserted if you want to have the, uh, the bandwidth and the performance, but yeah. It depends a bit on what you want to do. Maybe you want yeah. to go for a for the highest clock. Yeah, for the highest clock yeah. for the world record. Then yeah, of then course you want to use one dim. Probably win. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, probably you, you need a board with with only two dims on the board, motherboard. For sure. If you want to go for records, then definitely a two dim board will perform better than a yeah. four dim board. Um, so let's continue indeed with memory. Yeah. Okay. We've already started yeah, it. I'll, I'll leave it in a bias. We can show more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, DDR5 memory, of course, one of the very new features that you will find on the Elder Lake Z690 platform. Um, this is an option. Elder Lake also supports DDR4, uh, the memory controller. Um, but of course, you will need to make that choice when you're choosing your motherboard. So we have several DDR4 motherboards and several DDR5 motherboards. And let's go through the, the advantages of DDR5 a little bit. Because of course, every new um, memory generation um, brings some new possibilities. Um, you will always see higher speeds, of course, um, but also the memory density will be higher, and in the end, that will lead to bigger memory modules. Um, so it's, uh, for example, the, the density, density for DDR4 um, was uh, up to 16 gigabit, with DDR5 that's up to 64, uh, so that's a lot more. Also, on die ECC was not present yet on DDR4, but it is on DDR5. Um, 
Also the voltages is a little bit different. Um, actually changed quite a lot in how the voltage is delivered. We will show you more about that later. Um, and yeah, of course the, the speed is uh, the biggest difference. Uh, so the natively supported DDR5 frequency by Intel is 4800 megahertz. Um, and for Elder Lake on DDR4, that's 3200 megahertz. So you see quite a big gap there. When we're taking a look at memory performance, um, comparing DDR4 uh, to DDR5, and in this example, we're comparing the i7 11700K, so that's uh, a Rocket Lake i7 from the previous generation, um, with the i7 12700K. Um, that one has DDR5 in this situation, and the AMD Ryzen 7 5800X. Um, as you can see, the uh, i7 11700K and the Ryzen 7 uh, 5800X are very close. Of course, both are running uh, DDR4 memory. Um, for the i7 12700K with DDR5, you see that it differs a lot per situation how much DDR5 will benefit you. So, in certain examples like 3D Mark Time Spy, you don't see you see a slight increase in performance when comparing DDR4 to DDR5, but it's just a small step up. Um, yeah, but th then you're more comparing the CPUs and not the indeed, memory. Indeed, that's yeah. also, uh, of course, a factor here. Um, but in, in certain other workloads, um, here you see, for example, the, uh, the read and the write speeds and the copy speeds, there you will see uh, yeah. a big increase. Um, later on, we'll also have some benchmarks, right? With, yeah, uh, yeah. for example, 7-SIP, I believe, is a one that shows a lot of improvement with DDR5 memory. I think uh, yeah. Vinrar also gives you a bit of a bump. Um, so yeah, it, it really depends per program what the benefit is. Because with this new generation, timings are a little bit higher, but frequencies are also a lot higher. And different applications respond differently to this. Yeah, even some games, yeah. Yeah, even some games as well. Yeah. Um, let's first talk a little bit about other differences between DDR4 and DDR5. They're not interchangeable, so... No. Um, Somebody was asking, can you make like an adapter or yeah, like a... No, you can... Between PCB? You can, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can definitely not do this. So, both are 288 pin, um, but the position of the key, so in the middle, it, it won't physically fit. A DDR4 module won't fit in the DDR5 motherboard, and DDR5 module won't fit in the DDR4 motherboard. Maybe with a hammer, but then it doesn't work anymore. So yeah, they're, they're different. Also, one of the main <laughs> reasons that it would never work with an adapter is that the uh, DDR5 memory module, they have the PMIC on the memory module. Um, so basically, that is an additional chip that you will see on DDR5 modules. So if you go back here, you see um, uh, the black module is a DDR4 module here, the green one is DDR5 module. In the middle on top, you see a small power delivery circuit. That's the PMIC. Yeah. Um, and for DDR4, um, the right voltage is already uh, generated on the motherboard, and then the right voltage goes through the memory slot to the memory module. With DDR5, the motherboard will supply 5 volts to the memory module, and the PMIC on the memory module make it into a usable voltage um, for DDR5. And the standard voltage is, is 1.1 volts, but of course you can adjust this as well. Um, so if you're going to do overclocking using very high frequency memory modules, they will require a little bit more voltage. Um, but making it from 5 volts to a usable voltage for the memory module um, happens on the memory module itself. That's a big difference between DDR4 and DDR5. And that's also why it will never work with an adapter uh, from DDR4 to DDR5. Um, because you don't have that PMIC um, uh, in the correct way. In uh, DDR4, you will find on the motherboard. DDR5, you will find on the memory module. And the advantage of this is that you will get a, a clearer voltage signal because it all happens on the same PCB. Uh, so you don't have as much voltage variation as when you still have to push it through the memory slot to the module. Um, so this should give you a more stable voltage. That's the reason why the PMIC has moved from the motherboard to the memory module. This does, however, give you an extra heat source on your memory module. So here you see a DDR5 module, um, and you see that the hotspot on this memory module is actually not on the, uh, the memory chips themselves. Of course, they also heat up, but in this example, let me see, it's like 51 degrees approximately for the, um, uh, for the flash chips. 
um, but the PMIC in this situation uh, is uh, 56 degrees Celsius. So that's the actual hotspot of the of the DDR5 module. Um, that's also, I think, why you will see more modules with heat sinks, sometimes maybe beefier heat sinks, um, because basically there is more to cool on a DDR5 module than there is to cool on a DDR4 module. Uh, also, the, the memory modules that we're using today, those are the, the um, HyperX Fury Beast modules. Let me see if I can show them. They're on the, <laughs> the other side. Can you maybe get your phone? Yeah, <laughs> I have my phone right here. Well, let's try if we can establish a connection. It's hmm. on Wi-Fi, so it should be Let me reconnect. still 52. Uh, I, I didn't really uh, measure the temperature, but... Is the app still open for you? Yeah, still open. I cannot connect it somehow. Oh, okay. Should I... Re Maybe Close. reboot the application. Then. Yeah, okay, okay. Hang on. Otherwise, it's pitch black. <laughs> Is it on the wrong Wi-Fi? No, it's on the right. And the correct one. Yep. Yeah, still 52. Okay. Let's try again. Uh, hmm, strange. Keeps on loading somehow. Okay. Somebody else connected then, because it's already in Let there. me reboot as well. Yay, there yeah, we are. Yeah, we got <laughs> Yeah, so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, these are the, yeah, the ones with the heat sink. It's, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it needs to autofocus. Autofocus. So yeah. these are the Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 modules. These are DDR5 5200 megahertz yeah. uh, modules. So maybe you can point at where the PMIC is approximately located? Uh, it should be around here somewhere or on the other side. Yeah. Uh, I, I only, yeah, like I didn't measure them, but only touched them with, with my fingers. So it's, yeah, somewhere, I think here. On this location on, yeah, either this side or the other one. But yeah, so if you go really back to the slide, hot. this is what yeah. you will see with uh, the yeah. heat map. So th that's the one without the heat sink. And if that's going uh, 56 degrees, then probably with a heat sink over it, you will look at like 40 degrees. That doesn't really feel warm. No. It's just, yeah, lukewarm, I would say. Yeah. But definitely a difference between DDR4 and DDR5 in terms of also heat production of the memory module. Then let's take a, a look at the DDR5 power modes because this has also changed a little bit because there are basically three different power modes. You have the security mode, the program mode, and the OC mode. All our M uh, MSI Z690 motherboards are using the program mode. And this has to do with the different voltage ranges that you can have for your memory module. Um, so with the security mode, um, your, your voltage range is, is extremely limited or I think it's even fixed at 1.1 volts. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you're enabling XMP on certain modules, you require a higher voltage. Yeah. Um, so, with the security mode, you may not get stable um, XMP, XMP uh, frequencies, whereas with the program mode, it can also increase voltage with it. And then there is the OC mode that's mostly for extreme overclocking, and that's for if you even want to go beyond that 1.435 volts. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that by default. This is not something you want to run 24-7 uh, because it's quite a big increase um, compared to the default voltage of a DDR5 module. Um, so all MSI motherboards, um, they use the program mode by default. So then you have a range between 1.1 volts and 1.435 volts. Um, let me quickly take a look at the chat. Um, where it's out of stock everywhere, like DDR5, yes, it's it's still kind of hard to get at the yeah. moment. Um, we're aware of that, but unfortunately, we're not memory vendors, so it's it's out of our control as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely harder to get than DDR4. Uh, 
also has to do, it's a new product, there's still very yeah. limited availability for this. Um, but of course, we do expect this to, to improve quite a lot over time. And most memory vendors now, they only have a few kits of DDR5 still on the market. Um, yeah. Over the coming months, that will of course be expanded a lot. Um, so yeah, expect quite a big increase in terms of availability in the coming time. But in this, in this specific moment, it's still quite hard to get a kit of DDR5 memory. Yeah. The speeds will increase as there become more mature yeah. productions. And, yeah. and the same course, happened on DDR4. Yeah, yeah prices will also yeah. go down eventually. Yeah. Um, then let's take a look at the Intel official DDR5 speeds, because this is a little bit of a complicated story, right, Luke? Yeah, yeah, it is, because yeah, you have like the, the single rank and dual rank modules, uh, stuff that is not always advertised by uh, the memory module vendors. And uh, also you have motherboards with four DIMMs, like the one we're showing here. And uh, also we have motherboards with two DIMMs, like the Unify X, for example. Yeah, so these are both, in the in examples are both Unify motherboards. One is the regular yeah. Unify, that's the one you have in front of you as yeah, well. Yeah, that's this one. Yeah. And the other one is the Unify X, basically the same motherboard, like everything is identical, apart yeah. from the fact that the Unify X only has two DIMM slots. Yeah. So that's yeah. really meant for extreme memory overclocking. And that, that's the one you wa want if you want to do uh, uh, memory overclocking. Uh, but I, I think for most people uh, that just want to uh, have like a gaming machine and overclocking is maybe like a, an extra, then a, a 4 dim module, uh, 4 dim motherboard is the one that most people will choose. Yeah. But if you're going to play around on a 2 dim motherboard, then you can get some insane memory speeds. Yeah. Our in-house overclocker Top PC, he's also been playing around um, with these uh, uh, Kingston Fury modules and of course the Unify X motherboard because it's a 2 dim motherboard. Um, and he already managed to get DDR4 um, 86, <laughs> 170 <laughs> megahertz. So this is, yeah, it's an insane memory speed. Um, of course, this is not something you will achieve on a, on a 4 dim motherboard. This is the reason why yeah. uh, such a 2 dim specific 2 dim model of the Unify exists. Um, because by doing this, you have a dedicated uh, dim per channel. You don't have any noise from uh, an extra uh, um, uh, memory slot on the same uh, memory channel. Uh, so yeah, 2 dim motherboards. Um, so in our lineup, that's the MEG Z690 Unify X but also the MEG Z690i uh, Unify, so that's a mini ITX model. Um, those will have uh, higher memory support than the 4 dim models. So if you want to do extreme overclocking with memory, go for a Unify X or a mini ITX model. Then those are the way to go. But of course, to achieve this, you also need a memory kit that can do insane speeds. Um, this is far beyond officially supported um, memory speeds. But yeah, it's pretty pretty cool to, to see what it can do. And the possibilities with DDR, this is still the early stages, of course, of DDR5. So eventually, I expect this to go to go even higher. And this um, top PC is, well, he's addicted to overclocking memory. So he will, he will definitely go beyond this in the future. Yeah. But is then, that the same kit we're having here? Um, yes. Uh, These are also the, the Kingston Fury Beast modules. Yeah. You can see two here, but um, of course, when he's doing these uh, record attempts, he's using a single memory module, which yeah. will give you and an even higher overclock. Uh, but it's one, of the, yeah. uh, one module from, uh, from a Kingston Fury Beast memory kit. Another major change when comparing DDR4 to DDR5 is XMP. So XMP is ex extreme memory profiles. Um, and of course, we already had XMP uh, 2.0 in previous generations, um, but now with Elder Lake, Intel is also introducing XMP 3.0. Um, and the cool thing about 3. XMP 3.0 is not only that it will give you more profile options, so you get up to five op uh, profile options in total with XMP 3.0, but another very cool thing here is that um, two of those profiles are user profiles. So you have up to three profiles defined by the memory vendor, the XMP profiles, but you can also fine tune your own memory and uh, like with CPUs also no single memory module is identical. Um, so you can fiddle around a little bit with your memory module to see what it can run stably and then you can actually write that into the uh, SPD of the memory module. So basically you're saving those settings 
into the memory module itself. So also if you're moving that memory module to another motherboard, you don't have to change all the BIOS settings again. You just select the XMP profile that you, um, that you customized, that you made for that specific module. And you can load it in on a different motherboard. So I think that's a, a, a really cool feature. Um, and that's also something we can show in the BIOS, right? Yeah, we can. It should be still in a bias, yeah, okay. This is the CPU, uh, oh, this is the DRAM already. So, yeah, go to the advanced mode, then OC, and then go to the advanced DRAM, uh, DRAM configuration. And then we should go to XMP user profile. So, at the moment, there's nothing here, just user profile is set to auto, meaning that it's uh, doing 4800 uh, SPB timings. Um, but you can also uh, fiddle around with this one and say, uh, I want to copy, for example, XMP1. Maybe that's good to show first. Hang on. Let's go back one, oh, sorry, one menu. First, let's see what the, uh, the factory XMP profiles are. Because uh, at the moment with this uh, Kingston uh, Fury Beast 5200, uh, the XMP profile 1 is uh, just below this line. You can see it's 5200 megahertz, 40, 40, 40, 80, and 1.250 volts. Uh, if you, uh, I select the XMP profile 2, the factory profile, then it's set to uh, 4800, uh, CL38, and 1.1 1 .1 volts. So that's uh, uh, lower bandwidth, but also lower latency. So yeah, it's a trade-off between latency and, and, and bandwidth. <coughs> so what you can do with the uh, uh, profiles, let's go to the advanced DRAM configuration, then go to, uh, where is it? Oh, I'm already past it. To the uh, XMP user profile. In this system, I have two DIMMs inserted, and I could say uh, load setting two. So XMP P1, that's the factory uh, 5200, and I can set, set it to uh, user P1 in the module. <coughs> so let's do that. And then this module, uh, we can uh, adjust if you, if you like, if you uh, want to raise the voltage or whatever you want, or even the timings, you can fiddle around with it. And, uh, then you can write profile to memory and can say write uh, P1 to all DIM. So let's do that. And now user profile 1 in both DIMs should be identical to uh, the factory uh, P1, profile 1. And something you can, for example, do here, um, if you're taking those settings from an existing XMP profile, but maybe you got lucky in the silicon lottery yeah. and you have relatively good memory modules, you can maybe run those settings at a lower voltage. Um, so you can, for example, copy those settings, lower the voltage a bit and see if it, your system is still stable. Um, yeah. And when you, for example, find out by the default is in this situation 1.25 volts, but you find out that your, your uh, memory modules can already run these speeds at, for example, 1.18 volts, then you can define that into your um, uh, own XMP profile and for example use that one instead. And also if you're then moving the modules to another motherboard, you can again select that XMP profile so you don't have to yeah. change all settings in the BIOS again. A good way to do that is for example, that's what I did before and tried it. It's called memory try it. And if you do like 5440 uh, CL40, that's possible. If I load this and go back into the BIOS, so first I need to load this uh, setting. I think, I'm not sure, maybe I can already do that. Um, and go Shredder X98 is asking, is it risky? Cur no, you can just clear CMOS and then it's back to SPB, SPD timings. Yeah. So then it runs at 4800 uh, in this case. So you can just do a little bit of trial and error to see what your what your modules can do. I 
Actually, no, it, it just took the 5200 part, so because it's it's running at 52 at the moment. Hey, Hop Kayo is asking, ah, okay. does DDR5 get hot? Uh, what is hot? I, I think it, yeah, what we saw in the example is 56 degrees. That's definitely not hot. And that's for without a, a heat sink, even. Yeah, we're, we're talking about a power chip that most power chips can uh, go uh, even beyond 100 degrees uh, without too much problem. So uh, I, I don't think 56 degrees is uh, very yeah, hot. And the, and the 56 degrees is for the PMIC. The yeah. flash chips are even a little bit cooler. Yeah. And also the default voltage of DDR5 is only 1.1 volts. That's relatively low. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say they really get hot. Hang on, I, I'm, I'm trying something here. This is all quite new to me as well. Uh, and and what I've noticed is that, for example, uh, at the moment there's still a user profile defined. And if I do erase all user profile once, it's still there. So there is still some, uh, it's a beta bias and it's still quite new, so um, it still needs some fine tuning as well. Uh, I wanted to go to memory, try it, then load up the 5400 CL40 because I know that one is working. So I'm gonna uh, save and exit this and then go back to the XMP. So basically you're overclocking the memory with yeah. 200 megahertz now. Yeah, exactly, yeah, and keeping the same cache latency. So yeah. uh, that will help with the performance, uh, especially in the memory intensive uh, tasks. Always asking, does Gen, uh, Gen 3 M.2 SSD work in a Gen 4 Intel motherboard? Yes, it's backwards compatible, no problem at all. Yeah, Gen 2, Gen 1, all working. You can use all of them, yes. Santosh is saying, DDR3 user here, don't know why I'm watching. Well, if you're still on DDR3, <laughs> then maybe it's time to upgrade. <laughs> okay, so uh, just below the MSI Insider logo, it says 5400 megahertz. So that's the speed we're running now. What you can do in the uh, memory, advanced memory configuration, where is it? Over here. Um, and then go to the user profile and say current, load settings, current to, to, P1? No, yeah. Current to P1. Then we get the 5400 and the Castellate C40 with the 1.25 volts. And we should write that to the uh, right uh, P1 to all dim. Yeah, that one. And now it's saved to user profile 1 in both dims. So if we're gonna select this one and save and exit, we should have 5400. And even if you move the DIMMs to another motherboard, it would still have the user profile one at 5400 Castlight C40. Hopefully we can boot into Windows and show you uh, that the timings are exactly what we said it was. Mm, Joe Harper is asking, uh, guys, are SSDs M.2 PCI Express Gen 5 in the market? Not at this point. No, not yet. Uh, actually, a couple of streams ago, we talked. Uh, we had a guest from Fizen, um, and he actually talked uh, a lot about the different uh, generations uh, in terms of SSDs, so the different PCI Express generations. So if you're interested in more information about, for example, PCI Express Gen 5 and even beyond SSDs, definitely uh, go check that out. He had some really interesting uh, notes there. So at this point, the fastest SSDs are still PCI Express Gen 4 SSDs. But of course, in the future, we will see PCI Express Gen 5 SSDs as well. David James says Gen 3 is still very fast. Uh, yes, PCI Express, it, yeah. it depends a bit on what you want to do with it, of course. Especially for graphics, PCI Express Gen 3 is not that much of a bottleneck at the moment. You can see, see slight variations, but very in very specific situations. Um, for storage, their SSDs can go 
far beyond um, Gen 3 speeds. Um, but of course, it depends on what, you, what you're what you going to do with it, no, because on no. the other end, where you want to copy your files to, for example, also needs to be that fast. So if you're running multiple Gen 4 SSDs and you're moving files around, then Gen 4 is definitely faster. Hey. If you're only gaming on it, it's not like your FPS will all of a sudden increase a lot because yep. you're running okay. a Gen 4 SSD instead of a Gen 3 SSD. So it depends on what, what you're doing with it. In productivity workloads, it's more useful than for gaming, for example. So now we're running at 2700 megahertz, which is in DDR terms, it's uh, 5400 uh, megatransfers per second. Because DDR and stands for yeah. double data rate. So you have to double this number and then you have the clock speed. Yeah, and then the time is of 40, 40, 40, 80. And so that's the default timing timings of the module. Yeah, I don't really understand. So, and also 1.25 volts, which is, yeah, it's not listed here, but yeah, we can trust that it's uh, doing that. So we, we can do it like a memory benchmark and see what it does compared to yeah, let's 5200, take a look. like the, the regular one, or yeah. Uh, the, most, yeah, most memory overclockers, they use the AIDA uh, memory benchmark, which of course is a very, uh, it, it's only like a memory benchmark, so uh, you will see the, the biggest benefits, but I if you're look at, looking at gaming or, or even uh, the Cinebench, the, most games don't respond that much to memory speed, so. It's not like it scales 100% to you. No, game. definitely <laughs> not, no. So the memory speeds are, are really very high, and also, um, uh, but the, also the latency is also higher than, for example, DDR4. And that's something you see yeah. every generation. So when we're going yeah. from DDR to DDR2, you could see a big increase in speed, but also yeah. an increase in latency from DDR2 to DDR3, DDR3, DDR4, and now of course DDR4 uh, to DDR5. You yeah. always get a latency penalty if you're going higher with those frequencies. Yeah. Um, Dunks Place is asking, dare you fire up Prime 95? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Later on we will do it. We, we also want to show you, for example, Power Draw. At the end of the stream, then, if, if it burns down, then... It doesn't matter. It's the end of yeah. the stream anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the memory test also takes some time. Uh, I can also run it on the DDR4 system and then compare. Yeah, good uh, idea. Of course, this is yeah best case scenario for DDR5, of course. Uh, Let me switch to the auto capture. Yeah. Yeah, it's also running, yeah. I don't know if you have side by side, and maybe I can drag I actually the do. window. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there we go. So even the first read speed is also a big, big gap. Fifty-seven against forty of uh, eighty-four. So that that that's a huge difference. But it, it's yeah, it, it's only like a memory bandwidth uh, uh, program. This that's testing and the latency should be in favor of the DDR4 modules they're running at DDR4 uh, 3600 cast latency 18 so, so that's also a bit higher than the official Intel supported speeds that's 3200 megahertz yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah 3600 megahertz is a very common speed nowadays for memory modules they're also uh, pretty affordable yeah. 3600 megahertz yeah uh, I think cast latency 18 is quite normal uh, we also have some you're getting a warning on your ddr5 yeah <laughs> it, it says it's not fully optimized for the cpu of this computer meaning that uh, aida knows that uh it, it that maybe the results are not 100 percent uh, trustworthy on a alder lake cpu because still uh, very new and they may need to patch the software yeah uh, also uh, we had some issues with aida uh, uh, running on amd with windows uh, 11 and uh, I got some mixed score, so one run would be very different to the next one. So, um, not sure if Aida, yeah, apparently the, the later versions uh, uh, from October were okay. And uh, this one is from 26 October, I believe. It's the uh, latest beta one. 
but uh, yeah, it, it's it's just for reference. You know, it's uh, uh, good to know that DDR5 does have the potential to uh, to perform a lot higher uh, if your uh, program or game uh, can make use of it. Uh, one of the games that responds well to memory bandwidth is uh, Watch Dogs Legion and yeah, maybe also some other titles, but um, we haven't seen any other games that respond that well. And this also often comes with optimization. Always when yeah. something is new, it still takes some time for software yeah. also for developers to optimize their software in order to benefit from certain new um, technological changes. <laughs> Yeah, also the, the error is on the DDR4 side, yeah. so that, that's normal uh, with this CPU. So uh, the software is not complaining about that we're using DDR5, but it's complaining no, about no, that we're using a yeah. very new CPU. Also not like a read or write error or copy error. But yeah. <laughs> so the latency is 61.9 uh, uh, for the DDR4 and 69.7 for, uh, for the DDR5 mo uh, model. Uh, of course, that, that's a little bit overclocked uh, to 5400 megahertz now. Um, also, one thing to know, note here is that uh, programs like AIDA, but also HW Info, will show it as a quad channel. Um, I think that part is also in your presentation. Uh, uh, basically, it's, it's a dual control with dual channel, yeah. and then uh, that's also boosting the uh, the bandwidth. Yeah, well, later on we will get some, yeah. some more information about that because we also have some comparison comparisons between yeah. DDR4 with this new quad channel yeah. um, controller and the dual channel. And the, the DDR4 module uh, model, uh, uh, the, the, the CPU is still the same, uh, but it shows dual channel. So it still, yeah, uh, it still has two controllers, but uh, it doesn't address the DDR4 modules. Uh, with the same burst length as the as the DDR5, so uh, the, the DDR5 has the advantage in, in bandwidth always. Uh, another good program to show is uh, WinRAR. I think uh, I personally don't use that anymore, uh, but it, it, it shows the, the the difference quite well. And normally I would use 7-zip, but the the benchmark in 7-zip. Uh, exaggerates the uh, yeah the benefit of DDR5 a bit too much in my opinion. Can you move him to the middle? Oh, a sorry. Bit more? Yeah, hang on. Oh, then I need to move the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. that's one. <laughs> um, Andre is asking, do you guys have 3600 CL16 or CL14? I'm not sure if these modules can run. Yeah, we have CL16 uh, in in uh, eight gig. Uh, modules. Yeah, so at we the took these it, because it's there's two also times 16 gigabytes yeah. against two times 16 gigabytes, and the 16 gigabyte modules for DDR4 are Castle latency 18. So yeah. So uh, this is the difference uh, th that really shows what what the memory can do. So the 34 uh, megabytes per second on a DDR4 and the 37 or almost 38 uh, megabytes per second in the DDR5. Uh, uh, model uh, with the same CPU, so I, I think this is, uh, yeah, th th that's wh why uh, DDR5 eventually will be the better choice. Joe Hardware is asking, do you think if DDR5 uh, will make a scene with it for future games? Um, it depends very much on. Um, well, for example, the game you're playing, the resolution you're playing on, the type of GPU you're using, you will, you may see uh, an increase in performance. For example, if your CPU or if your game is very CPU limited, so mm -hmm. for example, if you're running an esports title, running 1080p resolution, insane high frame rates, then you may see a difference. Yeah. But for example, when you're playing at 4K, a triple A title. Um, and then you become, of course, GPU limited, then you will not see um, any major difference between DDR4 and DDR5. It, it really depends on, on your specific situation, if you will see um, any difference at all, and how big the difference is, um, if there is any. So yeah, it's, it's a hard question, question to answer. Uh, yeah, the main answer basically is, the more CPU limited your game is, the more you will generally benefit from faster memory 
than when it is. <laughs> not entirely <laughs> true. Because yeah, not entirely indeed. It's, no, that it, makes it so it's difficult. A, it's a bit weird because, yeah. like the, the the ones that are the highest frame rate, like the CS:GO and, and and for example the Rainbow Six Siege, you would expect that to benefit from from the the faster memory. Yeah. But actually they don't. So yeah, Watch Dogs is quite a yeah. The, the frame rates are not that high. Usually you're uh, playing around 100 frames per second and not 800 frames per second like CS:GO. Yeah. So it's not a CPU-bound title, but it, it it responds very good to to memory speeds. And that's quite strange, actually. But still, yeah. it does somehow respond in that but way. But I, I think it has something to do how the program is written. Not, yeah, not it's not meant or it's not on purpose. Probably it's just by accident. Um, and this is also something that can change over time if you have yeah, this for yeah. a longer. If DDR5 yeah. exists longer, of course, uh, game developers, they will find out better how to benefit from faster memory speeds. Yeah. Um, so also expect to, to game uh, developers to, to optimize their game for those higher yeah. memory frequencies. And then it sti will still differ title to title, um, situation to situation, resolution to resolution, how much the difference will be. So it's, it's, yeah, it's still quite hard to say. Yeah, so the result for 7-zip, that's the program I normally use for compressing and decompressing uh, files. Um, uh, it, it's the the, the uh, decompression number is like 144 uh, to 145, so that, that's very similar. Uh, but the, the compression rate is uh, 125 giga instructions per second against 71. So that yeah, that one is a massive difference. That's yeah. a very big difference, like 60%. Uh, increase. So even within the same program, yeah. different tasks can still respond very differently to higher memory speeds. Yeah, and I also tested the older 7-zip and it has basically this, the same difference. So, um, yeah, this, uh, even the test, uh, uh, you can see that this test took 63 sec seconds, while th the same test took 90 seconds on the DDR4 model. So. Yeah, it's definitely taking more time on the DDR4 model. But th this is e even a bigger gap than we saw with AIDA. So AIDA is the memory test. And this one's shown even bigger uh, uh, performance gap. Yeah, but only in compression, not in decompression. Yeah, uh, indeed. So, yeah. I also did some compression, like just took a bunch of files and compressed it and timed it. And then, yeah, the DDR5 was faster, but not by that much. It, it didn't took like 60% uh, more time. So I'm not sure why this test responds this way. So that's why I included the window. I, I believe that uh, the difference in performance is, is more uh, closer to the truth uh, than this, uh, uh, this result. A quite common question that we get is, is it worth it to go for DDR5 over DDR4? And that's also a very difficult question to answer because it really depends on your specific situation. If you, for example, already have a very fast DDR4 memory kit, um, then it may be worth it to take that DDR4 memory kit with you to an Elder Lake upgrade. Yeah. Um, because you can still get very good performance out of a very fast DDR4 kit. But of course, the very fast ones, if you're buying a new system, if you want to buy a very fast DDR4 kit, those are also pretty expensive. Um, so if you really want to see a big price difference, you will go for a cheaper DDR4 kit, and then you will, of course, see a bigger difference yeah. um, in terms of memory performance. So it, yeah, it really depends on if you already have a very fast DDR4 kit and if you're going to upgrade, or if you um, need to buy new memory anyway, because then it may be worth it to already go for DDR5, because you know that with DDR4 in the future, you probably after that system, you're done with those memory modules as well. Whereas with the DDR5, you can, for example, take it with you to a next system, which you already basically know that will be more difficult with a DDR4 uh, module. So it's, yeah, it's a very hard question to answer. Is it worth it to go for DDR5? Um, I would say that it depends on, your, uh, on what you already have mostly. If you have a very fast DDR4 kit, I would definitely take it with you with Elder Lake. If you're going to buy a new memory kit anyway, then I would personally go for DDR5 right away. That, that would be my recommendation in that sense. Um, let's talk a bit about the new gear modes. 
Because this also changed a little bit for DDR4 and DDR5, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, the gear one mode is basically that the clock of the memory uh, and the memory controller clock are one to one. And the gear two mode means it's one to two. So basically the memory controller clock is half of the speed of the memory clock. So with DDR5 they've added another gear and that's gear four. So basically the, the memory is running four times faster than the memory controller clock. And that, that's just to make sure that the memory controller can do its work properly. So the higher the memory clock, uh, the lower uh, or the bigger the, 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 the divider or uh, the performance difference or clock difference uh, between the controller and the memory. So this, of course, has to do with the very high frequencies that DDR5 yeah, yeah. can achieve. And with DDR4, we, we know the, the tripping point of our bias. So uh, anything up to 3600 will uh, be in gear one mode uh, by default you can still select gear two if you want um, <coughs> but that, that's the slower option of course because the memory controller needs to wait like two um, two clocks uh, for every data and uh, the, 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 um, for, for DDR5 we don't know what the default tripping point is between gear two and gear four so we don't know at what speed the, uh, the memory will uh, switch back to gear 4 mode. But that's also because we don't have very fast DDR5 modules yet, so we're just in the 5200 range now. And uh, yeah, we expect this to change in the, in, the, in the future that there will be also like 6000 and, and even higher uh, memory modules. That yeah, I think some modules we were already yeah. announced with up to 7000 yeah. megahertz uh, XMP protocols, I believe. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Um, of course, DDR5 extremely new in yeah. with the new memory generation. You always see well lower uh, frequencies, still high compared to DDR4, of yeah. course. Um, but in a couple of years, you will probably look back. Oh, by then it was only 4800 by default. Um, in a couple of years, you can expect to be quite a lot higher, and also yeah. the memory modules will go along with that. Yeah, I remember DDR4. The first kit we had was 2133. Uh, I'm not sure about the test latency. There were even uh, 1866 DDR4 modules. I yeah, but then the difference between DDR3 was very small. Because yeah, you had some DDR3 yeah. kits that were faster than certain yeah, DDR4. Yeah, and also kits. lower latency. And the same yeah. happens with the DDR5 versus DDR4. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it can still be that if you have yeah. a relatively low frequency, high latency DDR5 kit, yeah. It can be slower than a DDR4 kit with a very high frequency and a relatively tight latency. But of course, those DDR4 kits are very expensive as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's a difficult one. <laughs> yeah. It's mm -hmm. always like that in the beginning. Um, then let's continue to our next topic. We already touched on this a little bit, and that's the memory controller and the channels. Yeah. Um, because this is a big change, and not only DDR4 to DDR5, but also DDR4 in the previous generation and DDR4 in this generation, right? Yeah. So basically there's like two controllers, uh, um, two memory controllers in the CPU, meaning that the bandwidth inside the CPU, so coming from the modules, is also higher. And that translates to, for example, the AIDA memory test that the bandwidth on uh, DDR4 on 12th gen is higher than, for example, on 11th gen. And that's because of the two controller parts. And with the DDR5, it goes even higher because then you also have the yeah. burst length 16. Yeah, because of the, the burst length has doubled, meaning that the data uh, uh, that can be uh, written or uh, read can, can also double. So basically that's why the, the software programs are seeing it as quad channel, with, but officially it's not, too, not quad channel because there's no uh, not uh, four physical channels uh, connecting the memory to the um, to the CPU. So physically, it's still two channels. Yeah. But in a way, it is designed now. The system yeah. kind of yeah. sees it as being a quad channel. Yeah. So setup. the burst length is, is just basically how much data it can get from the memory or write to the memory at one time. And if that doubles, that means you can write two times the amount of data in the same uh, the same time. And of course, this is just a theory, but we also have a comparison of how, how does this translate into performance. Yeah. Um, so this is a comparison between 
uh, Rocket Lake S, so that's a previous generation, Intel 11 generation, yeah. and in this specific example we're using the 11900K, and then we have Elder Lake S, new 12th gen Intel Core, and in this example we're using the Core i9-12900K, and both of these uh, are running uh, DDR4 memory, um, but you can still see that there is a little bit of a gap in performance. Um, so this, in this specific example, it's a yeah. AIDA 64 copy test. Um, and this really comes because of the different memory layout, basically. Yeah, yeah the dual controller part. The dual the controller, CPU. yes. Yeah. So you can see that even with the same memory speed, the same cache latencies, both are running DDR4, yeah. you will get more performance out of your DDR4 as well when you're running an Elder Lake CPU when comparing it to a Rocket Lake CPU or yeah. any other CPU that's on the mark has been on the market for a longer time because all of them are basically running the um, the same um, memory controller type that Rocket Lake is running. So as you can see on the um, diagram on the left in the in the blue box. So yeah, even if you're going DDR4, you can expect a bump up in uh, performance with Elder Lake yeah. comparing it to the previous generation. Then there is something else to keep in mind, and that's the memory module itself, because there are different types of memory modules, but not all yeah. of them are the same, and not all of them perform the same. No. So this is, for example, DDR4 times 8. So this is the DDR4 as we know it right now, mostly. Yeah. And if we take a look at the performance, um, yeah, you will see different frequencies, cache latencies, of course, the higher uh, the frequency, the, the higher the performance goes. But then in DDR5, there's also DDR5, X4. So you can already see the small PMIC we drew on there. <laughs> That's DDR5, X4. X8, X8. Yeah. Or uh, X8, sorry. Yeah. Um, you will see, of course, the higher performance with the higher frequencies. But then there is also DDR5, X16. And that one has fewer memory chips. Um, so this is, yeah. for example, something you may find on higher density uh, or bigger modules in the future. So, so have actually, you no, no. The, the, the DDR5 by 16 is probably the 8 gig. Or uh, sorry, um, because modules, yeah, yeah, you have, yeah. you have fewer modules. So this but is something. Yeah. The chips is chips are higher yeah. density. So and this is not something you can see them. from the no. outside, right? Uh, if there's a heat sink over it, you don't see it, no. So if and you buy it, you don't know what you're buying. No, no, the memory module vendors also don't show the spec uh, on, on every spec list. So, uh, yeah, better double check what you're getting, yeah. Yeah, so probably uh, my guess would be that over time you will see lists popping up at, hey, these modules yeah. are DDR5 times 8, yeah. hey, these modules are DDR5 uh, times 16. And this is not new. I mean, DDR4 yeah. also is available in... Uh, X16, and we, we see that in uh, laptops uh, also happening. That that some uh, s some laptop models, gaming laptops, are uh, yeah are introduced with the X16 uh, DDR4s, and some with the X8. Usually, the the faster models, the the more high-end gaming models, uh, always uh, come with the uh, by eight, the the X8 uh, uh, type, so the faster type, and. The, and that's a little more, bit confusing yeah. because it's a lower number, but X8 yeah. is faster than X16. Yeah. Because it, it, it can read and write to uh, multiple chips at this, uh, simultaneously. Because you physically yeah. have more chips on the module. And it has something yeah. to do with how the pages inside the, the, the memory chips are uh, controlled. So th th there's, yeah, if there's less chips, that means that the bandwidth will uh, drop. So and let's take a look yeah. at how this translates into performance. Because the dark blue bar in this example is the time 16 module. So as you can see, there is quite a performance gap when comparing yeah. DDR5 time 16 to DDR5 times 8. The times 8 module is significantly faster than the time 16 module. Yeah. So yeah, it it can be really hard to find out before you buy a module whether or not it's a DDR5 times 8 or a DDR5 times 16 model. But it, I would say it's worth it to dive into it a little bit to see if you can find the answer, because it will give you a performance difference. Um, <laughs> Warpath is asking, will they be using this in a new COVID vaccination? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> no, I think they, they already had uh, the, the Gen 5 in, uh, inside, right? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have five reception? Yeah. Oh no, this is DDR5, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, David James says, I'd wait when 11 is full of bugs. It won't run quite a few games with Elder Lake. It's it, I, I would say, yeah, over time, um, the game support on, on Windows 11 and Elder Lake will, of course, become better. Um, but the thing is, Elder Lake really does perform better on Windows yeah. 11 than it does on Windows 10. Yeah. So yes, of course you can run Windows 10 on Elder Lake, but yeah, you're missing out on performance. So yeah, yeah that's a, that's a trade-off basically. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would say if we're going for a new Elder Lake system, I would go for Windows 11 right away, and over time it will improve. But if you're playing a very specific game, a lot of hours in, <laughs> in the week, and you specifically want to play that game, and that one doesn't work, on the combination of Windows 11 and Lake at this moment, then of course I can understand if you're still going for Windows 10. Um, but yeah, Elder Lake simply yeah. gets but more performance out of it on Windows 11. But also games on, on Windows 10 have, have the problem with the DRM stuff, so uh, going to Windows 10 won't solve all your problems. Uh, I think better go better wait. Yeah, only until, few, yeah. yeah. If the, the game you want to play is on a list that doesn't work with all the lake, either on Windows 10 or 11, just wait. I mean, hopefully that the game developer will uh, introduce the, the patch and, and then it's good to go. Uh, or we, we can show you later, it's a, we have a workaround. Uh, sometimes that works, but it, it's, it's still in testing. So yeah. uh, we're not sure, um, at least I'm not sure what it does exactly. Uh, it has something to do with e-core parking, but apparently, or at least for, uh, as far as I can judge, uh, th that's always happening in, in Windows. So, And that's basically to have that legacy game support. Yeah, that's how it's called in a yeah. bias. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you in, in a minute. Yeah. yeah. A um, few minutes. Let's first take a look at storage, because, yeah, on Z690, um, also a big difference with Z590, the Z690, will give you Gen 4 lanes from the chipset. Z590 only gave you Gen 4 lanes from the CPU, but the chipset was still limited to Gen 3. With Elder Lake and uh, Z690, because you get those lanes from the chipset, you can get a lot of very fast storage. So in this example, you see um, this is our Unify motherboard, so the one that Ruth has in front of him right now. And that one, for example, offers uh, five M.2 slots. So that's a big step up comparing to previous generation. Um, and four of those are Gen 4. Um, and then there is an additional Gen 3 slot. Um, most of our ATX models um, have at least four M.2 slots, even the Dash A Pro model, which is one of our more entry level, well, entry level is maybe not the right word for a Z690 motherboard, but one of the more, in the, in the Z690 lineup, one of the more affordable models, that one already has four M.2 slots. Um, our mini ITX model, the MEG Z690i Unify, even though it's a mini ITX model, it also offers three M.2 slots. Um, so that's also new for mini ITX because uh, in the past, they were limited to maximum of two M.2 slots, one on the front and one on the back. Um, in this generation, we have two on the front and one on the back for three M.2 uh, slots in total on mini ITX. Um, so yeah, uh, the, in terms of storage, um, you can do a lot with this new platform and Elder Lake. Um, and also in terms of storage performance, yeah, it's the, the uh, PCH performance also is almost identical to the CPU performance. That's not something we've seen on all platforms so far. Sometimes you see a little bit of variation when you're running um, yeah. an M.2 SSD through CPU lanes or through the PCH or chipset lanes. Um, on Z690, there is barely any difference between the CPU lanes and the PCH lanes in terms of performance. Um, maybe also has to do something with the upgraded DMI because Z690 uh, runs um, yeah. uh, Gen 4 with 8 lanes, whereas, for example, uh, Rocket Lake Z590 was Gen 3 with 8 lanes, and Z490 was even Gen 3 with 4 lanes. So the DMI got upgraded a lot over the past two generations. Um, and also, if you're taking, for example, a look at RAID performance, so if you're combining multiple very fast SSDs, um, so in this example, we're combining um, uh, multiple Gen 4 SSDs, so the second generation Fizen SSDs, those are extremely fast. Um, a single one 
um, can already do over 7,000 um, megabytes per second uh, read speed and close to 7,000 in write speed. And you can see that it scales really well if you're uh, using multiple of these SSDs. Um, so yeah, in terms of rate performance, also very fast on Elder Lake. Of course, if you want to get these numbers, you also need very fast SSDs. Um, if you're, for example, using Gen 3 SSDs, they also work perfectly fine because it's backwards compatible, um, but they will, of course, be uh, a lot slower than these second generation Gen 4 drives. Then let's take a look at the VRM because we already touched a little bit on power consumption and how power consumption in some situations can be quite high for these new CPUs. And that's where the VRM comes in because the VRM is basically what delivers the power to the CPU on the motherboard. Um, and we gave our Z690 motherboards quite a big bump up in terms of VRM performance. Um, so here you see an example of the, um, um, the power delivery on our uh, MEG um, there's the Z690 Ace, the MEG Z690 Unify that Root is currently using, uh, yeah. and also the MEG Z690 Unify X. They all use a direct 19-phase VRM design with 105 amp power stages, and this is specifically to power the CPU. So you have dedicated power stages um, to power, for example, the, the iGPU on the, on the CPU, etc. This is specifically to power the CPU. Um, so yeah, it's, this is a lot of power you can push from yeah. the motherboard to the CPU. And basically, yeah, it's for, for normal cooling, this is overkill because you will always run into cooling issues of your CPU earlier than that you will run into issues with, for example, your VRM temperatures. Um, so yeah, this is specifically something that's interesting. If you're going into extreme overclocking, then this can benefit you. Um, if you're only doing a mild overclock, this will of course be overkill. You will also be fine with, for example, our yeah. MPG models that also have a very beefy VRM, but not as extreme as these. Um, but especially the Unify X is specifically targeted at overclockers. Um, so that motherboard will specifically also be used with Sub-Zero overclocking LM2. So you, you really freeze your CPU. Um, but for the regular user, um, you will always run into heat issues of your CPU sooner than you will uh, run into heat issues on your VRM. Um, do, do you have an overview of the uh, what motherboards use what kind of power I, I don't have that today, but if you want to know for all models what kind of uh, VRM solution they have, go take a look at the live stream we had two weeks ago where we unveiled all, all our C690 motherboards and we went through all of them and also gave specific details. I think, well, maybe I have a slide, but let me go through this. Here you see, now, it's not all of them, but you can see, see most of the motherboards here. specific for the carbon. Yeah, carbon is included here. Yeah. This one, uh, these are our gaming models only, so this one doesn't uh, show anything about our pro models. Um, but in our previous live stream, you can also find out more information about our pro models. Um, but here you can see that, for example, the Z590A's previous generation already had 16 phase 90 amps, which was a lot, but in this generation, got bumped up 19 phase 105 amps. Uh, specifically the carbon um, that I saw a question about was uh, that one is an 18 phase, also direct power, with 75 amp smart power stages. Yeah. So also really, really strong power, de uh, power design. Yeah, those are the Renaissance uh, power stages, smart power yeah. stages. Um, yeah, so here's an overview of the gaming models. If you want to know more also about the pro models, take a look at the, the live stream two weeks ago. Of course, our in-house our overclocker, Top PC, has also uh, been overclocking the CPU. He does a lot with memory, but also with CPUs. And he also managed to overclock um, Core i9-12900K to 7558 MHz, also on the Unify X. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of power in, the, in this specific motherboard. Um, but yeah, also throughout the whole lineup, you will see that the, the VRM performance is, is really, really good. Um, and the MEG models for extreme overclocking are pretty insane. Another thing that of course has to do um, not only with the cooling of your, your VRM, but also for example the quality of the memory signal that you're getting on your, uh, on your DDR5 in this situation, um, is the number of layers that you uh, have in the PCB. 
And that one also got a bit of an upgrade uh, when comparing it to the previous generation. So for example, the Mini ITX model even goes up to 12 layers. So in the previous generation, the Mini ITX Unify was 10 layers. This generation it's 12 layers. Also some more models that were six layer in the previous generation or eight layer in this generation. Uh, so also quite a nice upgrade there. Uh, apart from the uh, Mini ITX model, the other uh, ATX models also have a two ounce thicker, thickened copper PCB. And that also helps with the cooling of the VRM. Uh, so by applying more copper into that PCB, um, you will get a more efficient heat dissipation from the VRM, um, not only through the heat sinks, but also through the PCB. Um, you may wonder, why is that not uh, included in a Mini ITX Unify? There it is, of course, more complicated because Mini ITX has got so many components in very little space um, that you have to be very efficient with uh, the tracing on your motherboard and also the different layers. So you don't always have the same space that you would have on a bigger motherboard. All motherboards also have the IT170 server grade PCB and that has to do very much with the very high frequencies that you're pushing through these motherboards, not only for the DDR5 but also for the PCI Express Gen 5. You really need a very clear signal in order to get um, these kind of frequencies through. Then let's go back to some more demonstrations I think because um, I already saw a question earlier about Prime 95 <laughs> if we were scared <laughs> to run that one. <laughs> oh, I need to download that one but or do I have it on stick? No, I will download it, it's not that big. <laughs> <coughs> so let's see if everything burns down. <laughs> oh, let's see. Yeah. So the memory is still overclocked but for uh, Prime 95 it doesn't really matter. Well, it hasn't been updated for a while. Hmm. So Prime 95 is a so-called torture test. Yeah, that's uh, two kind of programs that are this kind of torture for AVX loads and uh, especially on, on, on uh, what? It cannot be downloaded, that's it. why not? I'm not allowed to download, then I just get it from the stick. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, it's not that big, so I thought it would be quicker to do it from the website. Anyways. Um, uh, this copy. Oh, this is not the latest one. Damn it. Oh. Why? So you still do need the downloaded version? Yeah. Well, because the latest one is usually the the, the most stressful. Hmm. Why? Download software. Can you download it insecurely? <laughs> I'm not sure. This is a service and uh, it's not really what I need. Eh? Ah, Dunk's Place is still here. Who was asking for the Prime 95 uh, oh, okay. demonstration? <laughs> Get ready for some heat, it says. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. But there's uh, like two kinds of, oh, there's even a, a newer, okay, let's do that one. Newer. Newer, usually more hot. <laughs> 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 but uh, two kinds of uh, uh, applications that, yeah, stresses this, the Intel CPU in AVX extremely. And one is Prime95, the other one is Linpack or programs that use Linpack calculations uh, to stress tests like AIDA, FPU test, that's a lint pack. Uh, OCCT, that's also a well-known program for uh, stress testing, uh, that's also using lint pack. And those kind of loads seem to trigger Intel CPUs, especially on the, uh, the 10900K and the 11900K uh, extremely. I haven't tested it on 12900K yet, so uh, I'm just as curious as you guys. So let's see what it does. Oh, let's uh, open up uh, HW info. Then we can see the temperatures shoot up. Uh, Package like power. A maniac. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, the hottest test usually is the small FFTs. So let's choose that one because it fits in inside the cache. Okay, so we're going 250 watts. Oh, that's not that bad. By the way, this is yeah. with a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. Don't try this at home with a simple air cooler or whatever. Actually, it's quite good. Yeah, it's below 90. That's uh, 
it's lower than I expected uh, in package power. And if we're looking at, let me quickly check. I, d I don't see any smoke yet. Right? No, no, it's, it's still okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can. Uh, I'm not sure if you still have connection with the droid cam thingy. I should be able to make it. Yeah. yeah. And this is the total uh, the system power draw. Power, and we can also show you the the amps in the uh, amps on the CPU. That's AC. Sorry. So that's about 24.4 amps. It's a kind of. It's not really fluent, is it? Okay, let's go back to the other screen. So now it's uh, reaching 90. 90C, so that's, uh, that's not that bad. 260, yeah, normally when things heat up, uh, they, they start pulling more current, so more, more power. Uh, let's r r run this for a while. I mean, the, the environment temperature is quite Cool, I would say. I so roughly it. it's, 20? it's 22 degrees Celsius in here. Uh, I think it's a bit lower, but um, yeah, you're right underneath the air conditioning. Yeah, exactly. That may so the, the system yeah. is as well. So uh, if I had to guess, uh, it's around 20 C, I would say, or maybe 19. Let's see what 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 the uh, the MOS does. So uh, this is a Unify. It has 19 smart power stages, 105 amps. That that kind of power circuit is is way way more powerful than the 260 watts we're pulling now so it probably can do 400 watts or something but then this cooler won't cut it so and this is already one of the beefiest all-in-one liquid coolers that you can find yeah, yeah definitely yeah you could set yeah put maybe even faster fans on it because we're using the, the silent fans now. But uh, even though it's silent, it's, uh, it's still running at 2600 RPM. It actually is very yeah. silent. I can barely yeah. hear it. So th but the fan speed is still quite good for, yeah. You could do like 5000 RPM fans on it. <laughs> <laughs> but cooling the CPU will be a much bigger problem. So you need extremer cooling in order to overclock any further and still uh, draw this kind of power. As you can see, the VRM is still chilling. <laughs> yeah, it's around 52 now, so yeah. So that's where the, the 19, 105 amp yeah. power stage is coming. Yeah, and this is without airflow. So around this area, around the, uh, the heatsink of the, the VRM, there's no airflow. The airflow is here. It's uh, in the radiator below. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're not Maybe I can go with this one. So basically, the, uh, the here is the radiator. Then I have a, a setup that's uh, above that. Yeah, maybe the the fan in um, the liquid cooler is enabled. I'm not sure. Is there a, a fan in this one as well? Yes. Can you lift the cover? Yeah. Because then it will, of course, also help oh, a little yeah. bit okay. with the cooling. Yeah, it's running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So there is some airflow going around the, yeah. uh, the heating. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's my bad. I thought only the K had uh, uh, that. Uh, no, the fan S also has it. Oh. And of course, on the on the Unify, it's still fine if you okay. if you don't have that airflow. It's powerful enough in terms of VRM. Um, if you're running a more entry level yeah. C690 motherboard, then of course that will be more beneficial to have some additional airflow with it. Yeah. The, um, also, the, the heat sink on this thing, on, on the, the power circuit is so big, it, it hardly feels warm. So yeah. I, I would say it's below 40. Yeah, it also has a heat pipe in there. Yeah. It has a back plate it, behind it as well. Before you have uh, uh, heated up that block, I mean, the board is really heavy. So it, it will take uh, longer than this video. But yeah, the CPU is uh, yeah, settling at 91, 92 degrees, I would say. And the MOS is settling at 56. It's still climbing a little bit, but I'm not expecting... Oh, the CPU is getting hotter as we speak. And the power draw is going to 274. I so think that has to do with Prime 95, the yeah. build-up. Yeah, it has the, uh, the FFT size. And some FFT yeah. sizes have higher loads than others. So, it, yeah, it, it has a mix of, of different sizes. And sometimes the, it, it will, will shoot up and then it will go down again. 
Still no smoke? No. Nope. <laughs> uh, I'm comfortable running this all day, but uh, I'm not sure when it will start throttling though. I'm probably at 110 or something, I would say. A 105 was in the uh, previous generation. So we're still good. <laughs> yeah, but if you build this inside a case and run the Prime 95, then don't expect it to uh, keep it under 100 degrees. That's, no. that's impossible. But th this kind of work, this kind of load um, is doing about 60 watts more just for the AVX load than uh, the Cinebench, which is probably the most extreme test you can do in a normal program. So this is not, it, it's not really yeah. a realistic load right now? No, uh, unless you're really interested in prime numbers. <laughs> yeah, then. Yeah, then this is realistic for you. Yeah. yeah. I personally don't care for prime numbers that much. <laughs> but yeah, but it, it's a nice stress test, and uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the only problem I have with it is that it responds very differently on an AMD system. In an AMD system, especially it, with AVX, indeed. Yeah, it, it's still drawing the same power with AVX uh, Prime 95 as it does without Prime uh, without AVX Prime 95. Yeah. So. So now Intel it looks responds like differently. Yeah, and yeah. Like I said, this program is just for stress testing and, and, and heating up stuff, so. Still not throttling. It looks like the power draw is down a little bit again. Yeah, it's, back, yeah, it's now at 270, so. Yeah. And yeah, temperatures are in the 93, 92 range for the CPU, yeah. Well, uh, we can also show different core temperatures, right? So the E cores are at 70, yeah. 75 to 76 at the moment and the the p cores are between 84 and 92 and the package is is a little bit higher so uh, the so package is the hottest part in this so yeah not so the, this not is the, the, the difference you you see for example in this graph yeah that yeah. the the p cores of course they draw more power so they yeah. do get a little bit harder than the e cores and as you can see here as well that goes more for the higher end CPUs for the 12900K than the with fewer cores, of course. Yeah, um, of course, yeah. Because it's easier to dissipate heat if you have fewer cores um, than when the same size CPU is crammed with a lot of cores. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, so yeah. still all good? Uh, I, I did some tests also with, with some auto overclocking and not with Prime 95, but with the, the Cinebench uh, thing. Uh, and then I, I got even higher power draw. So I, I got the package power up to 290, and on the wall I got 400. So, so 400 that's your record watts. so far, pushing 290 watts through it? No, no, it was not intentional, but I, I was just <laughs> checking what, what the auto overclock did. But, but that's the highest you've seen yeah, so far, right? Usually the auto overclock stuff just raises the voltage too much, way yeah. too much. And uh, I, I used two things. So one is the, the, the game boost in our bias, which is eh, a very simple overclock, but it works. Uh, but it also has to work on, on CPUs that are lower quality than this one, for example. Yeah. And uh, the other one was XTU, uh, that's the Intel program for, for adjusting and, and overclocking on the fly. The extreme windows. tuning utility. Yeah. And they have an optimizer inside, so it just does a scan and then sets a, a higher voltage and a higher uh, turbo clock. Uh, and then you can also benchmark. And that did almost the same. So also 400 watts on the wall and about uh, a 290, uh, I think even more, uh, 295 on the, on the package. So package Dunk's power. place, does this satisfy your stress test needs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for you. So uh, especially <laughs> for you. Yeah. But I was also interested to see what it did, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's not nearly as high as, as the uh, 10900K. That one went over 300. Yeah. So shall we do some CPU overclocking? Yeah, we can do that. In the meanwhile, if you haven't participated in the giveaway yet, go to msi.com slash two slash insider, or if you're watching on Twitch or YouTube, you can also follow the direct link to Gleam that our bot puts in the chat once every five minutes. Um, and we've got a very special prize today. You have the chance to win an MPG Z690 carbon Wi-Fi motherboard. Yeah. Um, so perfect motherboard for one of these new Elder Lake processors. Um, like you just saw, um, I believe it was 
18 times 75 amp smart power can stages you, for the VRM. Yeah. Can you switch back to the... Yes. What's also interesting to see is that, uh, and that's different from the previous generation, is that the, the temperature here was about 95, and then a second later it's already 45. So this is also the improvement of Intel uh, doing with the heat spreader, with a thinner uh, uh, contact material and stuff like that. So they, they, they really improved the, the, uh, the heat uh, transfer uh, in the, this new package. Uh, that's, uh, usually it's a lot slower, so it, it just drops off quick, but not this quick. That is impressive, yeah. Especially since we've heated it up for more than a few minutes. Okay, uh, I will go into buys and then uh, show you the overclock thing. Sounds good. Yep, okay. So make sure to time it well. Let me see yeah. if we have some more questions. Tommy is asking you guys having any estimate dates yet or if we're going to see another godlike version again. No, but maybe you will see it eventually. Maybe not. Can't tell you yet. Um, Chris Mo is asking on Twitch, is the Z690 Edge Wi-Fi only DDR4? No, there will also be a DDR5 version of the MPG Z690 Edge Wi-Fi. Um, so the Edge will be available both in DDR4 and DDR5 versions. Um, same goes for, for example, Tomahawk. That one will also be available both in DDR4 and DDR5 versions. Um, and also some Pro models you can also get with both. Um, MEG models are always DDR5, Carbon and Force also always DDR5, um, and the Torpedo is also always DDR5. Okay. So back in the BIOS. Back in the BIOS. Um, one thing to, to note, uh, we have a CPU cooler tuning uh, stuff, but it's not that interesting at the moment because uh, as you can see, even the box cooler setting is below 241 watts. And you can only reach higher watts than this with Prime 95, which is not something most people use every day. Um, so um, th this is the Intel recommended setting. Uh, but normally when you start uh, the system for the first time, then it will greet you with a, a message and saying, uh, what kind of uh, cooler do you use? So in this case, water cooling and then it sets the power limits unlimited. If your water cooling is less beefy or uh, you want to have lower temperatures, uh, you can uh, also change that number here. So if you say I want to have a long duration power and uh, I have a, a water cooling that, that can do uh, about 200 watts and the, long, uh, and the short duration uh, power, uh, I, I can give it like, uh, for example, uh, even 300 watts is fine for a period of time and say, okay, uh, let's do maybe 56 seconds, that's the default. So if this is good for your cooling, then you should uh, tweak this kind of setting. Uh, but if you want to do overclocking and you want to do uh, unlimited, then normally we just go with Tommy says, uh, 4,096 watts won't ever happen though, otherwise the thing is going to burn down. Yeah, yeah indeed, it's, it's, it's just, just our yeah. way to say unlimited, basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it will yeah. indeed never get any close to 4,096 watts. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's just unlimited, basically. Yeah, and there, there's a, other stuff as well you can enable or disable. Um, uh, you can even limit the current, um, but on beefy motherboards like this, that's normally not set because yeah, the, the power circuit can do more than the CPU can throw at it at the moment. Um, As the Rockman is asking, is the XMP on? Uh, yes, we're actually currently yeah, still yeah. running the, the custom XMP profile, right? No, no. Oh, I, you already I switched, switched back, back to the to standard. The, uh, the, the, the factory XMP one. Ah, okay, so 5200 uh, megahertz. Because CL40. the first test we did with the Cinebench was mm -hmm. 27,500 something. Yeah, ah, yeah, so yeah. Roughly like that. So we can compare. Yeah, so um, I, yeah. I only did like a Cinebench 20 comparison. Um, uh, so far with this CPU, I could do. Uh, and I'm doing um, yeah, an overclock which is dynamic, so it's still throttling back to, to the a low frequency mode as well. And the p-core ratio I can set for 52, and 
also the e core I can overclock to 40. And I'm going to use dynamic mode. So uh, it's still going up and down. And when it loads the CPUs, it will go up to the, um, to the ratio I'm setting. The only thing I need to do now is uh, also set the uh, V-core. So the core voltage, uh, first I see, uh, set the mode, which usually I just go with the override mode. Also means that in idle, it will run at the voltage I'm going to set. So I'm going to just choose 1.3 and that's it. So this is the, the, the simple overclock uh, uh, way. Uh, and basically just save and exit and go for it. Yeah, all, all the memory times have changed from a user profile to uh, a factory profile one. To yeah. So it lists a lot of stuff, but most of the, most of the settings is uh, uh, is uh, memory related. Oh, I need to plug this in, and probably Windows will see it right away. Ah. Well, so you can see something on your screen. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I was late. <laughs> Uh, one thing I noticed on the Z690 is that the bias are not the fastest one if you change settings. So if you have the same settings, then boot up is quick. But if you change something in a bias, then it takes, longer. It takes a bit of time, uh, even before the, the first uh, 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 image on the screen. Not sure why that is. So if you see that happening and you, you play a... a play a lot of stuff in the, in, the, in the bias and you change a lot of stuff, then uh, yeah, just remember that it will come up, but it will take a little bit longer than you're used to with older platforms. Yeah, so don't get impatient. Don't press the reset yeah. button five times. <laughs> oh, we, we saw the same with the, the AM4, the, the AMD models. Uh, uh, also, when you swap CPUs, then it takes also very long time for the first time it boots. Uh, yeah, it's just yeah, the way of the platform, I would say. Okay, um, so now we should be running at 5.2 on the P cores. That's uh, 300 megahertz up from the default. And we should be running 4,000 on, um, on the E cores. And that's also what it's reading here. So uh, should be on all cores. Where is the clocks? Here they are. So this is the clocks. In the beginning, when Windows has started, then the, the fluctuations do not appear yet. So it's still in high frequency mode for about a minute, maybe one and a half minutes, and then it will start to uh, uh, what they call Intel speed step or Intel enhanced speed step. And then it will drop to 500 megahertz uh, before it was 800 megahertz on the older platforms. Um, here we go. So now it's going down to 500 megahertz, something like that. So this is how long it takes before the uh, the, the CPUs have settled. Um, let's do the Cinebench 23. So remember, 27,500 was the, um, yeah, the, uh, the multi, start or the, yeah, the yeah. default mode with the same memory timings. And now it's doing 5.2 gigahertz and the power consumption the CPU package power is at 245 watts uh, compared to 215 on the regular one. So it's about 30 watts more. And on the wall, it's a little bit more. So I'm not sure if the values are correct. And now we got, it has finished, 29,231. So points. around a little over 1,700 points increase. If you say so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And what's that in percentage? In uh, Cinebench 20, it ooh. was about 6%. Yeah, it could be approximately. Yeah. It, it was 6%, and I believe uh, you needed like 15 to 20% more power, depending on if you look at the uh, CPU power or the wall power. Yeah, it's always a bit like that with overclocking. You get yeah. exponential power increase. So, yeah. for example, 20% more power consumption will not give you 20% extra performance. No. So that's important to keep in mind. You will always exponentially use more power if you want to get more performance through yeah. overclocking. If you want to go any further, then you need to raise the voltage even more and probably, uh, definitely, you need more cooling than 
this yeah. cooler can do. So uh, this is a, just an and quick, this is a three sixty yeah. millimeter high end all in one yeah. liquid cooler already. Yeah. Keep that in mind. Yeah. I also tried to overclock a little bit further, but then it crashed. Yeah. At, at 53 or 5.3 gigahertz, it, it crashed. If I uh, went up with the e course to, to 42, also crashed uh, with the same voltage settings. If I raise the voltage more, then also the power increases uh, exponentially again. So it, you don't get away with 30 watts more, but you will get uh, you will get more like uh, uh, into the 300 watts, and and that's hard to cool uh, in a regular setup. You then can do it, but then you will need to go for more extreme cooling solutions. Yeah, maybe like a phase change or change even LN2. Dry or ice. Dry ice, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have more slides or... No, no. this was all for me. Okay. Uh, what I saw... Uh, uh, I need to reset the, 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 the overclock because then... Nobody can say, hey, it's because you overclocked it. Hang on. <laughs> so I'm going to reset it and set it back to the normal setting. So that's uh, 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 normal clocks um, and also XMP, factory XMP 1. So 5200, gas legacy 40. Yeah, normal clocks is for this CPU up to 5.1 gigahertz on the boost? I think. Uh, yeah, for all core clock is 4.9 and uh, 4.9 for the P cores and 3.7 for the E cores. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, of course, with uh, lower threaded workloads, then uh, it will boost up to 5.2 already. Okay. So that's also nice to see that you can do like a 5.2 all core clock, which is the same as the single core or the single thread. Uh, uh, turbo so you won't lose uh, a single thread performance in that overclock with AMD normally you have a very high single thread uh, turbo not sure if, if they call it turbo or not but anyway <coughs> uh, but uh, their uh, the all core clock is not that high so if you're gonna overclock the all cores uh, uh, then it's probably lower than the single thread and if you do that in a fixed way, not in PBO mode, then you will lose single thread performance. So yes, the multi-core performance will be high, but the single thread performance will be lower than default. What I wanted to show you is, and also many people have asked it in the chat already, is that some games don't run an Alder Lake on Windows 11 or Windows 10. Uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is one of those uh, titles. Um, but there's a problem with it that it sometimes doesn't work and sometimes it does. So surprise, I, I surprise. Have no <laughs> idea if it's gonna work now, yes or no. But we're in bias default mode. We do have a workaround that I've seen made it work again. So hopefully it's gonna crash now, then go to the workaround and show you that it works. Now let's let's wait and see what it does. Probably it's gonna work now anyway. <laughs> it's always like that. If you want to show that it doesn't work, then yeah, <laughs> doesn't work. Then then it works. But we're gonna try anyway. And it has something to do with the core parking. So and especially uh, because of the difference between the P and the E cores, the the nouveau uh, DRM seems to yeah seems to freak out or, or crash or yeah not allow the program to start, something like that. And I also seen it differ if I load it up like um, like a stress test, like Cinebench before. So maybe that's something to trigger it, I'm not sure. So I'm just freewheeling here and if it, yeah, now it's just working. Or it looks like it's working, uh, normally yeah, it, it would crash here or already before this point um, if it crashes. Yeah, now it's okay. Now, now it just works. So far, so good. Hang on, <laughs> let's try that again. And uh, to see if uh, so now you're disappointed that it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what it means to say is that, or what I mean to say with this test is that it doesn't always behave the same way. 
So what you can see here, the, the lower parts, the lower eight, uh, those are the e cars and they are parked right now. I'm using resource monitor, that's just a, a tool inside Windows. Um, uh, just press Windows S and then type Resmon. And it's a bit like task manager on steroids. Yeah, basically if you do a uh, 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 task manager, go to performance and click open resource managers below here. So that's the same thing. Yep. But you can also ju just click uh, uh, here and say Resmon and then it also works. This is just a shortcut. So what I think happens is if you, uh, okay, let's just run Cinebench. If you wake up those cores and both are active and the Nuvo is starting for, in this case, Valhalla, then it's going to freak out because it sees two different cores or something. It's just my assumption. I, I really have no clue why or when it happens. But what I saw, and I, I was testing it yesterday for the first time, and uh, today I, I, I've, I've tried to make it crash again, and it didn't. So, yeah, I, I saw it crash once, and then I got away. Uh, I got a workaround in a bias, and that worked. But after that, when I disabled the workaround, it still worked. So, <laughs> so you cannot make it crash anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if my my theory is uh, any valid. And the the e cores are active now, and now it makes the de nuvo freak out or crash <laughs> or not allow the game to start. Maybe it's not, maybe it is. Hey! Yeah, <laughs> you made a crash! Confirmed! <laughs> oh god! <laughs> That's nice being right. <laughs> anyway, so the workaround, let's hang on, hang on, hang on. Should be... <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I'm just thinking and sometimes I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes the theories work. Yeah. And sometimes they don't at all. <laughs> yeah. So if the cores are already parked by Windows, it seems to uh, allow Valhalla to start. But if I stress those cores with Cinebench, then, then those are active. Both uh, cores, types of cores are active. And, and then, then it freaks out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hang on. You want to probably want to see the, the, the bias. Uh, the bias setting I'm, I'm, I'm going to change. Maybe, maybe it doesn't work I, I, if I do the Cinebench in advance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, here we're in the bias. And so we're going to the uh, advanced CPU configuration again, and then there's one setting which has appeared in, in the latest uh, beta biases. Uh, and that's called legacy game compatibility mode. And in, in the help So this text, is not in the stable BIOS yet. This is only no, in the, no, no. the beta oh, BIOS. Uh, yeah. I'm moving the mouse, but I always just want to point out at this point. But when enabled, pressi pressing the scroll lock key will toggle the e-core between being parked when scroll la la lock LED is on and unparked when LED is off. OK. That's a nice way to describe it. I have no clue because Windows was parking all the cores that it didn't need at that mo moment anyway. But maybe it's going to do this specifically for the e-cores when I enable scroll lock. So to test this theory, I need to run Cinebench first, see if we still have the, the same, oh no, sorry, we have to, in Windows we ne need to press scroll lock, meaning that scroll lock is on, eh? that, that's mm -hmm. what it said then run the Cinebench, then run Valhalla and see if it still starts. So see if that, that's a workaround. Sir Skilligan is asking, oh. does this happen on Windows 10 and 11? Uh, for some games on both and some games only on Windows 11. Some games yeah, uh, don't have this issue at all. I, I think most games won't have this issue at all. Um, there was already a statement from De Nuvo that they, they supplied their uh, game developers with uh, a patch already for Alder Lake, even before the uh, Intel launch. So, uh, yeah, so you can expect Ubisoft yeah. to patch this issue quite soon, and yeah, then you don't so. need to yeah. work around anymore. So what I'm going to do now is press the scroll lock. Huh, I've chosen 
a keyboard and I cannot see <laughs> that scroll lock is enabled. Mm. <laughs> it's just yeah, poor preparation on my part. Yeah, okay, Let, let's hope it's enabled. Is there a way I can see it? Is there like a Windows keyboard I can check? I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, testing the theory as we speak, or th testing the workaround, if that works. What I saw was with this workaround enabled in a bias, and even scroll lock uh, enabled on a different keyboard, uh, I still saw Windows parking different cores. But, and it still woke up those cores when I was running Cinemage. So, yeah, performance is still very similar. So it's, it's definitely using the E cores now. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, this it cannot, cannot be score happening without the E cores. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah okay. Twenty-seven and a half. K. So let's start Assassin's Creed Valhalla. See what happens. So if the workaround is any good, then now it should start. The moment of truth. <laughs> But you, you do need to set a bias setting, and you do need to press the scroll lock thingy. And hopefully your keyboard has a LED that shows scroll lock is on or not. Uh, actually, it looks uh, it already crashed in the previous uh, test. As the Maybe Rockman is going for dinner, enjoy your dinner. <laughs> oh, okay. What's for dinner? Yeah, I'm also curious. We also so have a viewer yeah. from Germany who eats a lot of pizza. Yeah, yeah, I remember <laughs> that one. <laughs> like every Wednesday is pizza day. <laughs> it works! <laughs> Joe Hardware was hoping that it would crash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, it seems to be working. Yeah. But yeah, yeah only in the beta aisle so far, you can do this. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, there's a lot of bias updates coming out, out every week. So yeah, it's always uh, short after a launch that goes very quick. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that's, the, that's, that's interesting. Now we should try another thing. That, that's the last thing for me, but I'm just curious. I'm uh, really <laughs> curious now. Now I'm gonna press. This is some live trial and error by Ruth. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, yeah, yeah. So I've pressed scroll lock again, so I'm assuming scroll lock is off by now. So I'm running Cinebench 23. And then go to Valhalla, and then it should crash again. If that workaround with the scroll lock thing is indeed working. <laughs> Any bets? <laughs> <laughs> Who says it's gonna crash? Jan uh, Seinoner is asking, is the beta BIOS yeah. available to the public? Uh, I'm not sure not if this one moment. is available yet. I don't for, think for, so, not I, yet. I think for this platform, yeah. no. For AMD platforms, yes. Okay, so Valhalla. You only have a few moments. I'm already starting Valhalla. <laughs> Tommy is saying, any chance to lower the in-game sound? <laughs> so our ears won't blow. I, I put it lower in uh, in OBS. So it should be better now. I think is, it's going to Is this start. doable for you guys? Hmm? What, sorry? No, the, <laughs> the noise of the game, the audio. Oh, right. It was apparently very loud. We couldn't oh, hear sorry, that, of I course. I didn't mute uh, the audio. Sorry. No, I Tommy think it's says way start. better. Yeah, OK, good, good. So actually. Yeah, the scroll lock thing maybe does nothing. Just the bias setting does all, all the... It's still working. It's still working. Nice. Uh, I didn't expect this. I, I thought it was going to crash as well. Yeah. 
I see a question in YouTube chat from Mohammed Arik is asking any AIO which supports LGA 1700? Um, yes, actually um, the MEG Core Liquid S series, the MAG Core Liquid C and P series, they all support it out of the box. For MPG Core Liquid K series, um, we have a V2 version that includes a bracket out of the box. Same goes for the MAG Core Liquid R series, so those are our two earlier models. Um, the V2 versions do already come with a bracket, but if you already own one that didn't come with a bracket, then we have uh, a free upgrade kit available. Um, so for this, go to our website, there you can find more information on um, how to request one. Um, you will be asked for your serial number and proof uh, of purchase, but then you can get one of these LGA 1700 bracket, uh, brackets uh, for free for our uh, liquid coolers that came without, so that you can still use them with uh, Elder Lake. Yeah, it just works. So maybe it's it, it's because of the, the the setting that it more aggressively parks the e-cores whenever it can. So before you you the Nuvo is starting or other DRM that that can gonna crash on, on the different cores. I don't know. It's uh, it's still a mystery how it works, <laughs> but but it works. <laughs> yeah, but y you can see that the the scroll lock thing is not always necessary. But I also had the the bias setting disabled, and then it still sometimes worked, but also sometimes didn't. Yeah. So it looks like uh, it's also a matter of chance. So sometimes yes, it will see different cores and it will freak out and. Sometimes you're lucky and it only sees the P cores and that's it. And it will just start. So hopefully the, the game developers will uh, update their software. Uh, maybe not all titles, but at least you can try this uh, workaround uh, when the new, uh, um, new feature is in the, in the released biases or when we will release the, the beta biases to the public. So Ruud, shall we go to our final task of today? And that is? Choosing a winner for a winner. our special prize. Okay. So maybe you can grab our prize for today. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, hang on. <coughs> I will draw a winner. So our winner of today will win an MPG Z690 carbon Wi-Fi motherboard. Of course, fully ready for these new 12th generation Intel Elder Lake processors. Um, on this motherboard, you can easily run all models all the way up to the i9, no problem. Even so with uh, Prime 95? Even with Prime 95? Yep. So our winner for today, the honor is yours, Ruud. Can you read it? It's Taiharo. Taiharo, oh. congratulations. Oh, Taihar Zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Taihar Zero, it looks like. Yeah. Congratulations, you won the MPG Z690 Carbon Wi Fi motherboard. Congrats. Uh, yeah. Please keep an eye out on your mailbox. Um, we will send you an email in the coming days uh, to request for your shipping data. Uh, and then we will ship it to you as soon as possible. And we hope uh, you can build a nice Elder Lake system with it. So, for um, next week, um, we will play some Battlefield 2042. Um, I believe it's still... It's, Early access starts, I think, Friday or something. Um, and then the game officially launches one week later. Uh, but of course, we will make sure that we have the early access. And um, yeah, we're going to shoot some in Battlefield. So um, Captain Eric will be here, of course. If it's Battlefield, you know that Eric will always be <laughs> here because Eric is crazily addicted to Battlefield. Um, and then um, uh, I think we will try to get all four of us uh, in with Ja and Peter as well. Um, yeah. Ruud, you're not really into Battlefield, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm not that much of a game. <laughs> okay, then, then we keep I, I Ruud for all the technical it, topics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Eric, Peter, Ja and me will play some Battlefield yeah. 2042. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining everyone today. We hope to see you again next week, same place, same time. And uh, have a great week and stay safe, of course. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.